It is with me an earnest and vital belief that as the Union has been the source under Providence of our prosperity to this time, so it is the surest pledge of a continuance of the blessings we have enjoyed and which we are sacredly bound to transmit undiminished to our children. Those are the words of Franklin Pierce, our 14th president, and the subject of this, the 14th episode of the Dead Presidents Podcast. Welcome to the Dead Presidents Podcast. I am James J. Hamilton. And I'm Stephen Lincoln Douglas. We're coming to you with our 14th president, Franklin Pierce. That's right. All too frequently, Franklin Pierce has been portrayed as a bumbling boob, as a fool, a klutz. And we here at the Dead Presidents Podcast are here to say, enough, stop it. It's time to know Franklin Pierce in all of his true colors. That's right, listeners. We hope you're feeling fierce. For a hefty dose of Franklin Pierce. But first, we gotta inject you with a little bit of top five action. And we got a pretty good one this week. Yeah, pretty speculative top five. That's right. We got, it's always uh, fun to ponder the great what-ifs of history. In the last couple of episodes, we talked about, like, what if Zachary Taylor had lived? Could that have been a significant change in history? Well, that's worth pondering. And also worth pondering, what about some of the guys that ran for president and lost? What kind of leaders would they have been? Could history have been forever altered? That's what we're going to talk about this week with the top five would-be presidents. Number five. Aaron Burr. Born in New Jersey in 1756, Aaron Burr was a colonel in the Revolutionary War He distinguished himself at the Battle of Quebec, saved an entire brigade from capture during the evacuation of New York. After the war, he practiced law in New York City, served in the New York State Assembly, and as New York Attorney General. 1791, he was elected to the U.S. Senate, helped organize the Democratic Republican Party in New York, and in 1796... He was chosen by a party caucus to be Thomas Jefferson's running mate. Many Jefferson electors, however, didn't vote for Burr as their second choice. They voted for Sam Adams or George Clinton. Burr finished fourth. In 1800, he organized the New York State Assembly campaign that swept New York City for the Republicans, giving them a majority in the state legislature and therefore control of New York's electoral votes. big deal. That's going to be the decisive difference this time between Jefferson and Adams. And in consideration of his services, Burr was once again chosen as Jefferson's running mate, but this time with strict assurances that the party would maintain unity in voting for Burr alongside Jefferson. Well, the party achieved such perfect discipline that Jefferson and Burr tied with 73 electoral votes. Uh oh. This is before the Twelfth Amendment. There's no real running mate. All the electors of the college vote for two men. And if the party is perfectly united, you get a tie. And the House of Representatives has to break it. But it's also broken by the lame duck Federalist House of Representatives. And they're going to have to choose between Jefferson and Burr. Burr faced pressure from his own party to declare that he would not accept the presidency. And he refused to do that. He, you know, didn't really openly seek it, but neither would he announce that he would not accept it. Right. And some Federalists felt like Burr's more moderate and he might be better than Jefferson, even though Alexander Hamilton advised that Burr was a dangerous man who couldn't be trusted with power, and that if the Federalists elected him, they would be responsible for him. The House deadlocked for 35 consecutive ballots, Uh, Eight eight state delegations voted for Jefferson, six for Burr, and two were divided. They needed a majority of nine out of the 16 states to win. On the 36th ballot, some Burr voters abstained, and Jefferson won. I kind of like the idea of Jefferson's warning. It kind of makes me think of, like, 
well, if you get this puppy, you're going to clean up after it. I'm not going to be yeah. cleaning up poop. Yeah, Hamilton, yeah, he doesn't want to clean up poop. But also the thing with Hamilton is that if the Federalists had put Burr in the presidency, then Burr and not Hamilton may be the leader of the Federalist Party. Right. Burr, and the same thing with uh, Jefferson. Burr had the misfortune of threatening the leaders of each party. And that's kind of why uh, he was so hated <laughs> almost universally is because both Hamilton and Jefferson were jealous, you know, and afraid that he could take over their party. You know, 1800, you know, neither of them had openly campaigned in that house deadlock, but Jefferson and Burr and their partisans spent decades afterwards accusing each other of scheming for the presidency. And after that, you know, Burr, he was persona non grata in the De Jefferson administration, yeah. despite being vice president. The New York patronage that was going to the George Clinton faction, not Burr's friends. But Burr, you know, he remained loyal to Jefferson for a time. In 1802, the Senate tied on its vote to repeal the Judiciary Act, a.k.a. the Midnight Judges Act. Burr broke the tie in favor of the repeal. It was said at the time that if Burr had repudiated Jefferson and voted against the repeal, he would have instantly become the Federalist candidate for president in 1804. Not that that would have been worth much, because the Federalists were not winning in 1804. Right. That year, 1804, George Clinton replaced Burr as Jefferson's running mate. Burr openly broke with Jefferson, ran for governor of New York, lost. That campaign fallout led to the duel with Hamilton. Right. And then in 1807, the Jefferson administration charged Burr with treason over his alleged plot to invade Mexico and possibly separate Western states from the Union. But he was acquitted for lack of evidence after Chief Justice Marshall defined treason narrowly. Wow. Yeah, I think it's pretty interesting to speculate about Burr because, um, let's see in the for, let's say the up in, until 1824 i think the first nine presidential elections burr is the only non-president who got anywhere close to winning any of those elections yeah so he's really the only person who got close and never became president if he he might, uh, he might surprise some of our listeners as a as a choice here because yeah. he has such a stigma about him mm -hmm. yeah he gets a pretty bad rap but like i said he was criticized by both parties who right. were afraid of him and i don't think he i th think a lot of the criticism of him was unfair up until around the time he dueled hamilton and then started doing the burr conspiracy yeah. i think it's almost like he spent his whole career trying to be above the fray and everyone was still slandering him anyway. Eventually, he got to the point where he's like, "Oh, you're all you all think I'm a villain. I'll show you a villain." Yeah. But in 1800, he had the reputation of being, you know, moderate, not idealistic. If he had got in there with Federalist support, he would have been in like a George Washington type position of having to have Hamilton and his supporters on one side and Jefferson on the other, and trying to keep balance between them. Yeah. And if he could have pulled that off, being from New York, being the big swing state, and especially if he happened to be in there when the Louisiana Purchase just uh, fell into his lap, yeah. could have been a, a huge thing. Because Hamilton, you know, his opposition to Burr wasn't, like, ideological. He just thought Burr was dangerous and uh, wanted power for himself. If Burr got in there and had a chance to maybe prove Hamilton wrong could have uh, got him on board, tried to keep the Jeffersonians on board. It could have been a huge thing. There could have been no Jefferson era, Jeffersonian era. It could have been the Burr era. Yeah. And also, Hamilton felt that if Burr got into power, he would never leave. So also, maybe there, Burr would have broken the two-term precedent and yeah, continued in power because he was a young man, a military hero, and... Uh, you know, a consummate gentleman. Or it could have all blown up in his face and probably both factions hated him and get, th get him thrown out of there. Yeah, that's the thing. It could really go either way in this case. 
And I think one thing that if he had gotten in there following the Louisiana Purchase, when a lot of Americans wanted to go to war against Spain for Florida and Texas, and Jefferson was not about that at all, I think Burr would have been more about that. Yeah. And we probably would have been in some wars uh, against uh, Spain, seizing some of their territory a lot earlier. Yeah, that's a distinct possibility. Mm-hmm. Oh, the speculations you'll have and mm-hmm. continue to have as we proceed to the top five would-be presidents. Number four. Wendell Wilkie. Born in Indiana in 1892, both of his parents were lawyers and he became a lawyer. He joined the Army when the United States entered World War I, but the war would end before he could make it to the front. He was raised as a Democrat and was actually active in the party, serving as a delegate to the 1924 and 1932 Democratic National Conventions. In 1929, he moved to New York to become corporate counsel for Commonwealth and Southern Electric Company, and by 1933, he had become president of the corporation. He fought a six-year battle against the federally created Tennessee Valley Authority, which was a competitor of Commonwealth and Southern, arguing that government intervention hurt the power industry. He met twice with President Roosevelt, and in 1939, negotiated to sell Commonwealth and Southern's assets to the TVA for an advantageous price. That year, he joined the Republican Party and was on the cover of Time magazine. He became the face of opposition to FDR's anti-business policies. He announced that he would accept the Republican nomination for president, but didn't run in the primaries, banking on becoming the compromise candidate at a divided convention. That is exactly what happened. Wilkie gets nominated on the sixth ballot after Ohio Senator and son of former President William Howard Taft, Robert Taft, and Manhattan District Attorney Thomas E. Dewey both failed to garner a majority. In the general election, Wilkie promised not to repeal the New Deal's social welfare programs and supported FDR's aid to the Allied powers, which turned off many isolationist conservatives. Now, late in the campaign, Britain, looking victorious in the battle for Britain, Wilkie starts speaking in more isolationist terms, calling FDR a warmonger, which prompted FDR to assure Americans that their boys would not be sent to a foreign war. Polls show Wilkie within striking distance, but he only gets 45% of the vote against 55% for FDR. He wins 10 states and secures 82 electoral votes against 38 states and 449 electoral votes for FDR. Now, this was the big no third term. Mm-hmm. I like I have that campaign button. It's Uncle Sam giving a thumbs down and just says no third term on it. Doesn't say anything about Wilkie. It's a Wilkie button. Yeah. From yeah, that, that Yeah, you'd think that alone would be a big reason to vote for Wilkie. Well, and another thing there is up to this point, FDR is not entirely successful. No. His first two terms have been, you know, nothing yeah, spectacular. The depression really. is still going on. Yeah. I mean, he's trying a lot of stuff that, you know, and really, we're talking like some socialist programs here. Mm hmm. And. Yeah, I think it's, by, it's not really helping. Yeah, I think by much. this election, FDR was almost trying to distance himself from the New Deal. And I think he pushed Henry Wallace off the ticket as vice president because he right. was too closely associated with the New Deal. Yeah. So Wilkie, you know, that that would have been the chance to beat FDR. For sure. Uh, after the election, Wilkie supported Lend-Lease Aid to Britain. And after Pearl Harbor, he supports FDR. And he actually gets sent on a foreign mission to North Africa, the Middle East, China, and Russia. He published the best-selling book, One World, about his travels. He ran for the Republican nomination again in 1944, but was defeated by Dewey, and was actually considered by FDR for the vice presidential nomination that ended up going to Harry Truman. He had a heart attack in August 1944 and died in October after a dozen more heart attacks. Had he been elected in 1940, he would not have lived out his term. And his running mate, Charles McNary, 
also died eight months previously in 1944, which would have resulted in the Secretary of State becoming president. Yeah, the line of succession at that time went to the Secretary of State. Yeah, yeah Wilkie, a businessman. Mm -hmm. Business background. You know, he's like the initial businessman candidate. Yeah, no uh, real political offices in his past. Mm -mm. He'd done some political work, but hadn't held public office. Yeah, but I guess he had the reputation of being kind of down the middle, a former Democrat running as a Republican. And then mm -hmm. 1944, he's considered as the Democratic vice presidential candidate. Yeah, it's pretty uh, By the guy who he ran against last time. Like yeah. that. You're not going to see that happen no, anytime no, soon. It's, and it's, another another chance that he could have become president. Yeah, definitely. I mean, not that Wilkie would have lived into the next term That's either. Right. But yeah, yeah, Wilkie was a really heavy smoker. Yeah, I think I read he smoked and drank a lot. So maybe yeah. maybe if he had been elected president in 1940, he'd have taken care of himself better and uh, lived yeah. longer. Or maybe the stress of the presidency would have caused him to have heart attacks even earlier. Yeah, yeah, you never know. And he he faced some uh, derision during the campaign. I believe there is an audio recording of FDR talking about whether or not to release a story about Wendell Wilkie having an affair with some secretary. Oh, yeah? And another thing they did, of course, was, you know, because we, we're not in the war yet. But yeah. we're not, you know, pro Hitler. Mm -hmm. And Wilkie was derisively called Vendel Wilkie. Yeah, they're making fun the of his. Uh, is he a German heritage, or at least had a German sounding name? Yeah. Yeah, he was having an affair with some other woman who was the ended up being the editor of his book One World. She was like an author. I'm forgetting her name now, but I had heard of her when I read it. But yeah, yeah. So FDR's third term, which would have been Wilkie's term, was his most successful. You know, that's the term where we're like winning World War II. Right. If Wilkie had been in there then, not only would the two-term FDR probably be remembered as a failure, but if Wilkie had been in there and done as good as FDR did in that term, he'd have probably been remembered as a great president. Yeah. He would have served one term, died, and been the guy who won World War II. Yeah. That could very well could have been when yeah, the Wilkie. Yeah, would have been huge. Mm-hmm. But it was not to be. No. And continuing on with the not to be, it's the top five would-be president. Number three. Henry Clay. Well, our listeners are pretty familiar with Henry Clay over yeah. the past... Uh, Score of episodes. Yeah. He really... Henry Clay's been a player since the Madison administration yeah. through the Fillmore administration. Yeah, honestly, one of the most important figures in early political history that didn't become president. Yeah, I mean, and probably more important than a lot of guys who did become president. Yeah, I mean, because I, I, when I think of uh, important figures that didn't become presidents, like okay, Ben Franklin, Alexander Hamilton, Henry, Henry Clay, Clay yep. Daniel Webster, you know, those type of people. Yeah, Clay, he was born in Virginia in 1777, moved to Kentucky in 1797, became a lawyer, was elected to the State House of Representatives as a Democratic Republican, became its Speaker, was soon elected to the U.S. House of Representatives, and almost immediately became its Speaker. He was a leader of the War Hawks, who pushed for the Declaration against declaration of War against Britain in 1812, and then he helped negotiate the treat, Treaty of Ghent to end that war. Got back in as Speaker of the House, where he developed the American system, the platform calling for a national bank, protective tariffs, and federally funded internal improvements. In 1820, he led the passage of the Missouri Compromise. 
In 1824, he finished fourth in the presidential election behind Andrew Jackson, John Quincy Adams, and William Crawford, and when the House decided that election, his support put Adams over the top. Adams named him Secretary of State, a move that was denounced by Jackson as the corrupt bargain. Indeed. Clay joined the Senate in 1831 and was Jackson's opponent in the 1832 presidential election, winning 37% of the vote and carrying six states and 49 electoral votes. In 1833, he helped negotiate the compromise tariff that ended the nullification crisis and earned him the nickname the Great Compromiser. In Jackson's second term, Clay led the formation of the Whig Party, whose platform was opposition to Jackson and support for Clay's American system. In 1840, the Whig National Convention passed him over in favor of William Henry Harrison. When Harrison's successor, John Tyler, refused to support Whig policies and killed an attempt to recharter the National Bank, Clay engineered his expulsion from the party. Clay left the Senate in 1842 and won the Whig nomination in 1844, but narrowly lost to James K. Polk. He won 48% of the vote, 11 states, and 105 electoral votes, lost the popular vote by only 38,000 out of 2.5 million votes cast. He sought the Whig nomination again in 1848, but was passed over once again in favor of another Whig general, Zachary Taylor. Clay returned to the Senate in 1849 and helped craft the Compromise of 1850, in 1852, he died of tuberculosis in Washington, D.C., and became the first person to lie in state in the Capitol Rotunda. Yeah. Henry Clay, a huge figure. Oh, yeah. Now, he's one where the speculation is more interesting, in a sense, because... There's so many different times. Yeah. Like, he, he ran, was... He, he basically so ran times. in... Five out of seven elections. Yeah. I think probably his best chance of winning would have been 1840. Yeah. When they nominated Harrison instead. And that may have also been his best chance to be successful as president. That's right. I figure if he got in there in 1840, we're not annexing Texas when we did. No. There wouldn't have been the Mexican-American War and then the sectional crisis over all the land we got from that. There yeah. probably wouldn't have been a civil war as soon as there was, if at all. And what happens But then we don't have the sea to shining sea yeah. America that we know and love. Well, that's what I was going to say. What happens if Clay gets in there in 1844? And well, Texas has been annexed, and suddenly we have Henry Clay as president. Well, I think if Clay had won the election of 44... Tyler couldn't have pushed through annexation in his mm, past several months because he used Pope's election as the popular mandate right, to jam true. that in there. But Texas yeah, wouldn't. Yeah, he might not have been able to do that had yeah. Clay won. Yeah, but te I mean, Texas would still be there. It might have, yeah. if things didn't go well for Clay, then a Democrat would have probably won next time and annexed Texas, and we'd be right back on the path we ended up on. So who knows? But yeah, he was a great compromiser. Mm -hmm. Abraham Lincoln referred to him as my beau ideal of a statesman. Yep. Lincoln was on board with the American system from a young age. For sure. Monumental figure, Henry Clay. Yeah. Got a figure, you know, if someone like him had been around in 1860, maybe we could have had a compromise. It's a distinct possibility. And that's going to bring us down to the top five would-be presidents. Number two. Thomas E. Dewey. Born in Michigan in 1902, Dewey went to law school in New York City, where he became a federal prosecutor. He took on organized crime during Prohibition and convicted the infamous bootlegger Waxy Gordon. In 1935, he was appointed special prosecutor for Manhattan with a mandate to tackle corruption and racketeering. He prosecuted gangster Dutch Schultz, who plotted Dewey's murder, and was himself murdered, at the order of the Mafia Commission, which feared that killing Dewey would provoke a major backlash. 
1936, Dewey convicted the commission's leader, Lucky Luciano. In 1937, Dewey was elected district attorney in Manhattan and continued to rack up high-profile convictions, including the 1939 conviction of Fritz Julius Kuhn, leader of the American Nazi movement. Dewey's efforts made him a national celebrity and earned him the nickname Gangbuster. In 1940, he was a frontrunner for the Republican presidential nomination, but with World War II heating up, Dewey's youth, he was 38 years old at the time, and inexperience in foreign affairs limited his supporters and a divided convention settled on compromise candidate Wendell Wilkie. In 1942, Dewey was elected governor of New York. He was a highly effective governor who managed to reduce state debt, promote business-friendly policies, and streamline government efficiency while also increasing funding for education, mental health, and public housing. He increased salaries for teachers and other state employees, passed the first state law prohibiting racial discrimination in employment, and established programs for veterans, water pollution, and reforestation. In 1944, Dewey won a major victory against Wilkie in the Wisconsin primary, forcing Wilkie's withdrawal from the race and clinching his nomination. In the general election, he criticized the New Deal as inefficient, corrupt, and communist-influenced, but did not attack FDR's military and foreign policies. Dewey would win 46% of the popular vote and 99 electoral votes, a stronger showing than any of FDR's three previous Republican opponents. Dewey would be re-elected governor in 1946 and won the Republican presidential nomination again in 1948. He was the heavy favorite to defeat incumbent Harry Truman, whose popularity was sinking amid a divided Democratic Party which produced third-party campaigns by former Vice President Henry Wallace, running as a progressive, and Senator Strom Thurmond, running as a Dixiecrat. Dewey was considered such an overwhelming favorite that he was advised to play it safe, avoiding controversial issues, and speaking in optimistic generalities, remaining vague about what he planned to do as president. Truman launched an aggressive whistle-stop campaign, and the race tightened in the final weeks, but Dewey was advised against switching to a more aggressive stance. He had great faith in the polls that showed he would win, but in one of the greatest upsets in American history, Truman won 49.6 of the vote against Dewey's 45.1 and captured the Electoral College 303 to 189. Everyone had been so sure Dewey would win that newspapers already had their stories ready to go, and the Chicago Tribune actually jumped the gun, printing 150,000 copies with the headline, Dewey Defeats Truman. Famous picture of Truman holding that up. Bing. Yeah. And the Chicago Tribune was a Truman-hating paper as well. Yeah. So. Dewey would be re-elected governor again in 1950, and in 1952 helped secure the nomination of Dwight Eisenhower for president and Richard Nixon for vice president. Many of his aides became prominent members of the Eisenhower administration, including Secretary of State John Foster Dulles and Attorney General Herbert Brownell. Now, Dewey, pretty, pretty cool figure. He actually he had studied voice as a youth. It was a good singer oh yeah decided to go with law instead but mm -hmm. yeah waxy gordon richard whitney lucky luciano that he inspired gangbusters yeah the show mm -hmm. like that's pretty huge how many how many other presidential candidates have inspired television dramas I could think I could there, I know of a president that's been in television dramas. Yeah, <laughs> but not inspired. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and how many people with a, holding a public office as relatively low ranking as district attorney are the front runner for a presidential nomination? Yeah, and like you know, the mob actually wanted to kill him. Yeah, yeah, he was busting up the mob when. You know, nobody else really was. That was like 20 years before they really started busting up the mob. Yeah, for sure. I mean, and actually, he's, he uh, is one of the best New York governors in history. Yeah, I was really... Uh, he, if not the impressed, best governor yeah, of New York in that history. Was, that was a really impressive uh, governor resume. Absolutely. Where he's doing, like, lots of shit. I think his motto was something about... Uh, 
you know, we, pay as you go progressivism. Like yeah. you can have all this and then also pay for it, mm-hmm. which members of both, you know, sides of the ideological spectrum often can't do both of those things. Dewey was doing it. Yeah. He seemed like a guy who just like knew how to get shit done. Absolutely. Super effective. And it's another interesting speculation here. Uh, if he had beat FDR, he would have come in at the tail end of the second world war. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, he could have got credit for wrapping that war up, and then, you know, of the next eight years, basically, a pretty yeah. good time. I mean, Truman pretty highly remembered for his uh, accomplishments during that period. Dewey mm-hmm. could have done the same, and then turned things over to Dwight Eisenhower. Yeah, and there could have been like a Republican kind of hold for a little bit because the Democrats. You got to remember, you're talking twelve years that. They've had the presidency. Yeah. And it, if Dewey had gone in at that point, he might have been considered one of the stronger presidents if he followed a similar trajectory in terms of what Truman ended up doing. Yeah. yeah he probably a, could have been considered a great president yeah. if he could have done what he was doing as governor as president For definitely sure. yeah and had he beat uh truman well that's an interesting one to think about because truman's term in his own right is considered the weaker of his you know terms he yeah. finished up his finish up to Roosevelt mm-hmm. is where Truman gets his high markings. Yeah. But then if Dewey had come in then and got reelected, he would have been in there during what is it ended up being Eisenhower's first term. Right. So it would have been encompassing the whole Korean War. Yeah. See if he could, uh, you know, do to Korea what he did to the Mafia Commission. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> It's a pretty interesting what if. Yep. And that is going to bring us down to the top five would-be presidents. Number one. Ross Perot. Born in Texas in 1930, Ross Perot became an Eagle Scout. He entered the U.S. Naval Academy in 1949. He left the Navy in 1956 with the rank of lieutenant. Then he became a top salesman for IBM, once fulfilling his annual sales quota in just two weeks. Yeah. 1962, he left IBM and formed his own company, Electronic Data Systems, which landed a lucrative government contract to computerize Medicare records. The company went public in 68, and within days, its stock price had increased by 1,000%. In 1979, when two EDS employees were imprisoned by the Iranian Revolutionary Government, Perot organized a rescue team that got them out of the country. Well, that's some pretty serious shit. Yeah. 1984, General Motors bought a controlling interest in EDS for $2.4 billion. 1985, Perot invested $20 million with Steve Jobs, who had just left Apple at the time. 1988, Perot founded Perot Systems, an information technology company that was acquired by Dell in 2009 for $3.9 billion. He has a knack for creating valuable companies. That's for sure. In the 70s and 80s, Perot was an activist in the Vietnam POW MIA issue. He criticized the U.S. government over potentially hundreds of American servicemen who may have been left behind in Vietnam. Pro is also the favorite would-be president of John Rambo. That's right. Because of that. He engaged in unauthorized back-channel discussions with Vietnam that caused tensions between Perot and the Reagan and Bush administrations. In 1990, Perot strongly opposed the Persian Gulf War and criticized Congress voting itself a pay raise while average Americans' wages were not increasing. In February 1992, he announced that he would run for president as an independent 
if supporters could get him on the ballot in all 50 states. He came out in favor of balancing the budget, ending the outsourcing of jobs, and electronic direct democracy. He benefited from populist resentment against establishment politicians and received support from moderates, liberals, and conservatives. In June, Ross Perot actually led a Gallup poll with 39% support, over 31 for Bush and 25 for Clinton. He's a third-party independent candidate who's leading the presidential election just a handful of months before That's right. the vote. But in July, his campaign fell into disarray with his top campaign managers resigning or threatening to resign, reportedly because Perot wouldn't follow their advice, wanted to handle everything himself. In mid-July, with his poll numbers decreasing, Perot announced that he would not seek the presidency, saying he didn't want the House of Representatives to decide a split election. Well, there's a deeper story there, too, where he was intimidated into dropping out. Yeah, didn't he say that he was threatened that the Bush campaign was yeah, going to Bush re- campaign was going to like release dirt on his daughter who was about to get married over yeah. some such. Mhm. But basically it got dirty and he didn't want to risk it. Yeah. So he which dropped was a sad mistake. He dropped out of the race at that point and a lot of his supporters were felt betrayed because he had been doing so good. And then October 1st, after he qualified for the ballot in all 50 states, he re-entered the race and appeared in the debates with Bush and Clinton. And another Gallup poll showed that he won the first debate. That's what people thought. Though he didn't end up winning any states, he did receive almost 20 million votes, the most ever for a third-party candidate, and he won 18.9% of the popular vote, the most for a third-party candidate since Teddy Roosevelt ran in 1912 as a Progressive Party candidate. In 1993, Perot opposed NAFTA and debated Vice President Al Gore on that issue on Larry King Live. In 1995, Perot founded the Reform Party and was its presidential nominee in 1996, receiving 8% of the vote. Wow, like, this campaign had gone differently. He didn't drop out. The campaign management aspect of it had gone more smoothly. You know, he very well could have won the election, or we we could have had a House of Representatives decision on that election. He was afraid of that happening. Well, he could have won that. It's possible. I feel like if if he was the clear popular vote winner... Yeah. That there would have been huge pressure on the House to choose him. Because you got to figure, every member of the House is a member of one of the two parties, and they, their instinct would be to vote for whoever their party's nominee was. But if things were so split, and Perot was taking support from both parties, yeah, like he's the compromised candidate, and if he got the highest popular vote, if Bush or Clinton had squeaked in that way, they were, their presidencies would have been doomed. Yeah. I will say, now, I agree with the Gallup poll in the first debate. If you watch the first debate on YouTube, I think it is clear that Ross Perot is talking sense and the other two are typical. Mm -hmm. Just politics as usual. Um, Also, Ross Perot funded, self-funded a whole series of PSAs on different policies for his administration and if you go back and watch them Mm -hmm. wow in hindsight did he seem right i I think with ross perot we could have been a lot better off i think the problem was he was honest about the fact that some sacrifices were going to have to be made now for things to be radically improved Mm -hmm. in the future Nobody wants to hear that. No. Well, a lot of people but liked what he was back, saying. He was right. Yeah, man. Like, so many things could have been different if he got in there. Because mm-hmm. things, you know, 
since this that time, things become increasingly more and more partisan. If yeah, you get Jay, what if he if he had got in there, what Jay Leno would have lost what like ten percent of his overall joke? Yeah, input? yeah. Perot wouldn't be given uh, Jay Leno the same kind of uh, dirt. Yeah. What was um, that? What was that? Uh, I think they said like ten percent of his like comedic yeah. output overall of his yeah. entire career. Yeah, t- well, 10% of all jokes told on The Tonight Show okay. were about Bill Clinton. Yeah. Yeah, Monica Lewinsky wouldn't have gotten her internship. Well, they didn't hold back from making fun of Ross Perot. They tried yeah. to make him look like a complete nutcase idiot, which is yeah. too bad. Well, yeah, he seems... And he certainly would be a different kind of guy becoming president. An Definitely. Eagle Scout. He's making his yearly sales quota in two weeks. Yeah. Um, I mean, this is a man that really knows business. Yeah, another guy who gets things done. And, you know, in the 90s, the term, you know, the time Clinton served was pretty good for the economy in general because the Internet was blowing up. Like, imagine if you have a in- information technology billionaire in there at the time. Yeah. Things could have been even better, maybe. Yeah. And partisanship might have been down. That's for sure. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Wilkie and Perot, two political outsiders, businessmen vying for the top office. Yeah. And businessmen of good character. Mm-hmm. Salt of the earth. That's right. Listeners, that has been our top five for the week. And as an added bonus, you can check out songs about each of these guys, as well as just about everybody else that has ran for president and lost, uh, thanks to Pittsburgh band The Warshats. That's W-O-R-S-H space A-H-T-S. Warshats. It's Pittsburghese for washouts. The Would Be President series makes for some fun, entertaining, and informative listening. An incredible series. I don't know if we want to, or you're trying to be modest, Stephen Lincoln Douglas under a different name, the creator and sole producer of that series, multi instrumentalist. Getting it done. I think you're thinking of somebody else. Yeah? No. Maybe I'm wrong. Whoever made that is a bad man. I'm going to agree with that. And I'm also going to agree that it's time to hear a word from our sponsors. And we'll be getting into Franklin Pierce right after this. Dead Presidents Podcast is brought to you in part by Barnum's American Museum, which has an exciting announcement. The Grand National Baby Show will take place Tuesday through Friday at Barnum's American Museum. One hundred of the most handsome infants will be on display, as well as the most extraordinary collection of twins, triplets, quarterns, and fat babies ever witnessed in the world. The children will be arranged on high platforms where they can be distinctly seen from 11 a.m. to 3 p.m. Eleven hundred dollars in prizes will be distributed among the most meritorious babies by impartial judges who are all ladies of respectability. The National Baby Show is open to children under five years of age from all parts of the world. Retiring rooms and cradles will be provided for the babies and their attendants. All who seek to compete for the prizes must obtain from the museum a numbered certificate. The number of babies exhibited at this baby show is limited to 100, and 90 babies have already received their certificates. Such a charming display of juvenile humanity was never before seen on this continent, and the public may rest assured that this will prove one of the most chaste, novel, and interesting exhibitions ever beheld. Admission is 25 cents, children under 10 just 12 and a half cents. Listeners, 
Does your baby have what it takes to compete at the National Baby Show? If your baby is as cute as you tell everyone it is on Facebook, you stand to win a big pile of cash. Be sure to register now because there are only 10 spots left. Tell P.T. Barnum the Dead President's Podcast sent you. We are the only presidential podcast that helps its listeners monetize their babies. If you don't have a baby, or if your baby leaves something to be desired in the looks department, you could attend the National Baby Show as a spectator. 25 cents to see a hundred of the world's most adorable babies in a bargain that can't be beat. That's a message from our sponsor, Barnum's American Museum. Now a word from our sponsor, Mrs. Price. Mrs. Price respectfully informs the ladies of the vicinity that she is prepared to manufacture infant's shoes on short notice in the best manner and on reasonable terms. You may call on her at number 2747 Main Street. Listeners, don't even think about entering the National Baby Show without updating your baby's wardrobe. If your baby shows up to Barnum's American Museum wearing the same janky old shoes it crawls around the house in, it'll be laughed right off the high platform and out of the competition. Go see Mrs. Price, and she'll hook you up with the most fashionable styles. Your baby will put its best foot forward with Mrs. Price's infant shoes. And now, a word from our sponsor, Pond and Morse. For the babies. Rocking horses... Toy carriages, toy wagons, toy wheelbarrows, toys of every description, sold for low prices at their new store by Pond and Morse. Listeners, there's no better way to spend your National Baby Show prize money than by picking up some new toys at Pond and Morse. Of course, you should spring for a night on the town for Mom and Dad. After all, it was your excellent genes that created that blue ribbon baby. But don't forget to reward the actual contestant. Pond and Morse is the favorite of babies everywhere. Their toys are the hottest in town. The best babies deserve Pond and Morse. Listeners, send us your prize-worthy baby pictures on Twitter at Dead Prez Podcast, where you can learn more about our sponsors and see their original ads published in newspapers during Franklin Pierce's presidency. And now, back, back to the show. <laughs> back ready to dive into this episode 14 the life of franklin pierce we're in that dark spot in presidential history the i always thought the period between jackson and lincoln those presidents until recently and thanks in whole part to our podcast, we've elevated these figures out of this murky obscurity. That Pierce is in that category there. This is. No. We're heading towards the end of Antebellum. Well, we're going to shine some light on Franklin Pierce, find That's out right. what this guy's all about. His story begins in 1804 when he's born in a log cabin in Hillsboro, New Hampshire. Sixth child of Anna Kendrick Pierce and Benjamin Pierce, a Revolutionary War hero who fought at the battles of Bunker Hill and Ticonderoga, he wintered at Valley Forge with George Washington. Yeah. A great character, Benjamin Pierce. He was, the story goes, he was out plowing when a neighbor rode up and told him, Shit's going down. And he dropped the plow, grabbed his musket, and headed off. Mm -hmm. Immediately. No hesitation. In classic fashion, putting down the plow for a weapon. And afterwards, he entered politics 
as a Jeffersonian Republican, served as a general of the New Hampshire State Militia, was county sheriff, and served two terms as governor of New Hampshire. That's right, and uh, as governor, he uh, personally paid uh, to release two different Revolutionary War veterans who were in debtor's prison. He paid off their debts so that they could be released because he felt that nobody that bled for our country should be locked up in it. Yep. He paid off their debts and let them go. He always wore a tri-corner hat, which was long out of fashion mm -hmm. even then when he was governor. But he had a great image, and he was a really popular guy. Well, it's a lot for his uh, son Franklin to live up to. That's right. It's a child Franklin Pierce loved the outdoors. He preferred swimming, hiking, and ice skating to doing schoolwork. But he had great personal charm. He was the ringleader of his playmates. You know, Benjamin Pierce lacked a formal education, but he made sure that his sons were well educated. When Franklin was 12, he was sent to Phillips Exeter Academy to prepare for college. There he learned Latin and Greek, and at age 16, he enrolled in Bowdoin College in Maine. He often skipped class to go hiking and fishing, broke the rules by sneaking out of the dorms with his friends to frequent a local tavern. By the end of his sophomore year, Pierce was ranked last in his class, and resolved to change his ways. Yeah. He pretty much for the first part of his tenure at Bowdoin is like pretty free spirited. Mm hmm. But when that list comes out and he sees that he's last in his class, he's pretty embarrassed and is like, well, shit. I gotta do something about this. And he does buckle down. He starts getting up super early, 4 o'clock in the morning, yep. to study. Hooked he, up with the a studious roommate. Yep, Zenas Caldwell. Started getting his... Super religious. He organized a military company called the Bowdoin Cadets. Joined the debating society. Um... His cadets got into some trouble with the Dean. Oh, yeah. They're marching past his residence. He was... It was an unpopular Dean, and it was a, uh... Hmm. Kind of a jab. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah, that's picture of, thing. Yeah. It's like Pierce appearing in Animal House. It's yeah. probably one of the more animal house of the early presidents. Yeah, and look at some of the characters you got there. Pierce, Nathaniel Hawthorne, Calvin Stowe, mm -hmm. who, uh, you know, if you know who Harriet Beecher Stowe is, that can yep. mean something. Wasn't uh, John Jonathan Silly? That's right. Was it Bowdoin? Jonathan Silly, one of the classic... Bowden crew. We'll be mentioning him a little bit later. Yeah. Yeah, I feel like somebody needs to write an Animal House movie about Bowdoin College with Franklin Pierce as yeah, the star. That, that's a good cast of characters. Um, yeah, so by the time he graduated, he was fifth in his class out of 14. But you got to figure he was 14 out of 14 at one point. Yeah. Probably after that, he was probably one out of 14 and landed in uh, fifth average overall so when he tried so he really hunkered down he got it done that's for sure yeah after college he went back to new hampshire and studied law studied under levi woodbury until woodbury went into the senate and then he studied under other attorneys until he was admitted to the bar in 1827 at the age of 22 began practicing in hillsborough became a very successful attorney he had a charming and empathetic personality, addressed jurors individually by their name, had an incredible memory, and was an excellent public speaker with a knack for appealing to jurors' emotions. Yeah, by pretty much all accounts, Franklin Pierce is one of the most amiable people 
that you could meet. Just a really stand-up guy. And really smart, charming, has a way about him. He, he makes an impressive uh, Im- impression on a lot of people. And yeah. that's going to lead to some bigger things. Mm-hmm. Well, 1827, his father gets elected to a one-year term as governor. Pierce campaigned for his father's re-election in 1828, organized a pro-Jackson rally. It's the year Jackson became president. Benjamin Pierce, unfortunately, was defeated that year, but Franklin Pierce was elected moderator of the Hillsborough Town Meeting. Town meeting, kind of a big deal. That's it. The following year, 1829, Benjamin Pierce returned to the governorship. Franklin elected to the state legislature, only 24 years old at the time. Yeah. He's coming in at a pretty young age. Yeah, and he's becoming an ardent member of the new Jacksonian Democrats. Over the next two decades, New Hampshire would be the most solidly democratic state in the North. That's right. Pierce supported the Democratic platform, opposing banks, paper money, corporate privilege, government-funded internal improvements. In the state legislature, he opposed the influence of Boston-based banks and railroads trying to expand into New Hampshire. He served two or he served four one-year terms, spent the last two years as Speaker of the State House of Representatives. Yeah. He's making a name for himself. 1832, he's 27 years old. He's elected to the U.S. House of Representatives. And a newspaper is going to praise him as a rising star, saying, quote, Frank Pierce is the most popular man of his age I know of in New Hampshire with praises in everyone's mouth. Every circumstance connected with him seems to contribute to his popularity. In the first place, he has the advantage of his father's well-earned reputation to bring him forward. In the next place, he has a handsome person, bland and agreeable manners, a prompt and offhand manner of saying and doing things, and talents competent to sustain him in any station. He's on his way up. He's on his way up. Well, Not looking too bad, but what's he lacking at this point? Well, he needs uh, another half. That's right. You know, on his way up to Congress, he gets engaged to Jane Appleton, the daughter of a wealthy Federalist family. But in contrast to Pierce, who was gregarious and physically robust, Jane was painfully shy, prim, frail, sickly, given to melancholy. In 1836, she had a son, Franklin Jr., who died three days after his birth. In 1839, she had another son, Frank Robert, who died of typhus at the age of four. The Pierce's only other child was Benjamin, born in 1841, who would become the light of Jane's life. Yeah, Jane, never a particularly happy person. Some of her letters almost hint at like kind of like a childlike mind in a sense. She would marvel over simple things in nature. But always kind of gloomy. Yeah, I mean, if you'll recall, episode 10, top five troubled first ladies, number two, yeah. Jane Pierce. It really seems like an odd match, these two. It's an incredibly odd I match think some of they are total polar yeah, opposites. I think some of Pierce's friends almost would, you know, wondered what he saw in her. They did. And also, yeah. she hates politics yeah and hates alcohol right and pierce is into both of those yeah pierce an uh, episode one top five drunkest presidents yeah. number one franklin yeah. pierce um yeah 
she doesn't like politics, but they left for Washington, D.C. hours after their wedding. Yeah. Pierce abstained from drinking during that congressional session, but Jane hated Washington, and she didn't go there most of the time he was no, in Congress. she'd stay in New Hampshire, she'd stay in Andover with her relatives. Yeah. And he'd be in Washington, D.C., living it up with a heavy drinking crowd. Yeah. And he... he gets to be pretty popular there. Mm-hmm. I mean, he's just overall like a really likable person. Yeah. The, the one thing that's recorded during this time is he would surprise messmates with literally the feats of strength. They would come into the room and he would be hidden and just suddenly come at them mm-hmm. and a wrestling match would ensue. And he would pin him to the bed maybe yeah. three times, four times before he'd give up and be like, all right. But he was known to be in really good shape, yeah. pretty strong. And, like, those shenanigans started back in back in the old Bowden days, but uh, continued yeah. up to, yeah. this, is, this is a guy in the U.S. House of Representatives right now. Yeah, Pierce and, continuing his Animal House days. Not in the college frat house, but in the congressional boarding house. That's right. Yeah, there's some really, really funny stories. There's, uh, he was visiting a fellow member of Congress and his wife, and he went to their room and said to the guy's wife, like, oh, you should go down and bring back, bring back some breakfast. And her husband said, like, no, I'll I'll go get it. And so he goes down to bring back some food. And Pierce locked the door, locked the guy out, and he came back. And this is Sunday morning, by the way. (laughs) And the ruckus that ensued, like, woke up, like, the whole floor. And, like, people were, like, pissed off. (laughs) Like, it's like, what the hell's going on here? Well, it was like Pierce playing a game with this guy, locking himself in a room with the guy's wife yeah, <laughs> on well, a Sunday morning. You don't want to leave your wife alone with Franklin Pierce. He's a pretty good-looking guy. And he could probably defeat you in the feats of strength. Yeah. Well, Pierce is in Congress during Jackson's second term. Good time to be a Democrat. Yeah. And Pierce gets a lot of respect for toe in the line in New Hampshire. Like you said, New Hampshire, the most loyal Jacksonian Democratic state in the country mm-hmm. for a long number of years. Yeah, Pierce supported Jackson's removal of federal deposits from the Bank of the United States. He voted against internal improvement bills pushed forward by the Whig Senate. Pierce was on the Judiciary Committee. He supported pensions for Revolutionary War veterans. I'm sure that made his dad proud. And Pierce was re-elected to a second term. This time he has to start confronting the national question of slavery. That's right. It's been rearing its ugly head. Well, Pierce was not pro-slavery, but he detested the abolitionist movement. Yeah, he's one of the types that look on them as shit stirrers that are just leading us towards a, a problem. Yeah. He thinks that if they if they would just back off that cooler heads are going to prevail here in the long run. But with that kind of thing going on, it's just going to get more and more heated. Yeah, Pierce thinks the abolitionists have kind of a holier-than-thou attitude and that they're threatening the Union. And that, you know, his... I mean, I'm not going to knock abolitionism, but he has a point in a way. So a lot of the abolitionists, like, I don't think... And we've talked about it before. And they wanted slaves to be freed. And they didn't want them to be their equals. Right. There's a, there's a lot of hypocrisy. It's Well, I mean, it's the, the nature of the white man. Shit. Let's act high and mighty, and then when it comes down to it, be a piece of garbage. Mm-hmm. 
Well, Pierce's dislike of abolitionists continued to grow throughout his career. He became increasingly hostile to groups that opposed slavery and its westward expansion. In 1835, he spoke in favor of the gag rule against abolitionist petitions in the House, argued that the right of petition meant the House could not outright reject the petitions, but instead they could simply table them without debate. He said that abolitionists were a tiny minority of fanatics and declared that in New Hampshire, quote, there was not one in a hundred who does not entertain the most sacred regard for the rights of their southern brethren, nay, not one in five hundred who would not have those rights protected at any and every hazard. And this is going to cause a problem. Mm Mm-hmm. Because you got pro-slavery Senator John C. Calhoun reads on the Senate floor from a New Hampshire abolitionist newspaper that attacks Pierce for that speech, saying that based on the number of signatures on abolitionist petitions in New Hampshire, at least one in 33 were abolitionists, and they called Pierce a doe face and said that he should resign. And he hits back hard with an indignant speech in the House noting that every county in New Hampshire had denounced the abolitionist petitioners. And he also said that most of those petition signatures were from women and children, and he had only been referring to white male voters when he's talking about uh, abolitionism. That speech earned Pierce much praise, and Calhoun apologized for having read the attack against him on the Senate floor. Yeah, that's pretty... John C. Calhoun apologizes to you. Mm. And says, like, uh, yeah, I kind of regret that I did that. Well, I don't know. Why was he reading that in the first place? To try to make the abolitionists look bad? Cause to try he... and say that Pierce was understating abolitionist power in okay. New Hampshire. Yeah. Because Pierce made it out like it's like a small fringe thing. And Calhoun's like, well, this says completely otherwise and it looks like it's getting out of control okay you know pierce was like you know hey fuck you fuck you buddy (laughs) well pierce is still on his way up now the new hampshire legislature is gonna elect him to the u.s senate yeah he becomes the youngest u.s senator up to that point well yeah let's see he's got to be just about 35 years old. That's March 18, 1837 that mm-hmm. he takes his seat just as Martin Van Buren becomes president and just as the Panic of 1837 is hitting the national economy. Yeah. Now it's not as great of a time to be a Democrat. Right. Pierce, he supports Van Buren's proposal to keep government deposits in federal treasury vaults where they could not serve as backing for paper money banknotes from banks, which the Democrats saw as fueling the reckless speculation responsible for the panic. Right. And this is going to be debated for years. Democrats finally enacting the independent treasury in 1840, only to, of course, have it repealed by Whigs the following year. Now, in 1837, Pierce supported the Senate's adoption of the gag rule, and in 1838, Pierce shares a boarding house with an old friend from back in the college days, Jonathan Silly, who was a new representative from Maine. Now, this is going to lead us to one of my uh, favorite little bits of history. The Silly Duel. (laughs) This is a whole wild story. So, Jonathan Silly is challenged to a duel by Representative William Graves after Silly refused to accept Graves' delivery of a duel challenge from a newspaper editor whom Silly had accused of flip-flopping his support in favor of rechartering the Bank of the United States after having received loans from the bank. So, he's getting into a duel, and it's not even the guy that he had a problem with. 
Yeah. It's yeah, like, we, hey, we, hello. I'm William Graves of Kentucky, and I have this dual challenge for you. What? I'm not taking that. What the heck is that? Well, then I challenge you to a duel. I feel insulted. Yeah. Like, that's pretty much how it played out. Mm-hmm. Uh, crazy. But Pierce is friends with Silly. What's he going to do about it? Well, he they he tries to talk him out of it. Unsuccessfully. Mm-hmm. And there's going to be speculation later on, because on Graves' side, this goes back to Henry Wise of Virginia. You'll remember him. He tried to challenge, he tried to goad James K. Polk into a duel. Henry Wise is a pretty volatile personality. Now, he's playing a role in this, and further up... I think Henry Clay actually wrote the initial letter. Yeah. And later on, when asked about it, Clay said that if he knew when the duel was going to happen, he would have notified the police to break it up. Yeah. And that poses the question, Pierce did know when and where that was going to be happening. Why didn't Pierce contact the authorities and stop it from happening well i don't know dueling is like a gentleman's agreement to operate outside the law getting the police involved isn't supposed to be part of it but you know there could be consequences to that because how did that duel play out well no as the challenged party silly has the choice of weapons Graves is a noted marksman. With a pistol. Right. Noted marksman with a pistol. Silly decides to choose something he'd have been familiar with from where he grew up, the hunting rifle. Now, a duel with hunting rifles... Seems crazy. Yeah. They're much more accurate than pistols at the time, which were very inaccurate. Right. No, well, we're not talking 10 paces here. They're over 90 yards apart. And each guy misses on his first two shots. Yeah, but duels, it's not just one shot. They keep firing until somebody is satisfied. That's right. And on the third shot, Graves hit Silly in the thigh and severed his femoral artery. He bled to death within minutes. And this left Franklin Pierce devastated. He actually, after a time, he was pacing around his room because he was going to go. And Silly said, no, don't get involved. Don't Mm -hmm. come. So he's pacing in his room waiting, and he gets impatient after a while, and he starts riding out to the dueling grounds. And he meets the carriage coming back with Silly's body, and he actually took and held on to Silly's rifle. He Mm -hmm. was was pretty devastated. He felt, obviously, grief and no small measure of guilt. Yeah. Wonders whether there's something he could have done. Well, that's... I think part of his guilt was because he probably could have done something if he would have done what Henry Clay said that he would have done later on when pressed about it. Yeah. He knew where it was happening and when it was happening. He could have, even anonymously, have tipped off the authorities and they could have solved it. But it wasn't to be. Jane would write, Oh, how I wish he was out of political life. How much better it would be for him on every account. Well, when Congress was out of session in 1839, the Pierce's move to Concord, New Hampshire. Pierce opened a new law practice. In the 1840 elections, the Whigs swept into control of the presidency in both houses of Congress. 
Pierce is now frustrated about being in the minority, and he's aware that he can't be reelected to the Senate because New Hampshire Democrats observe a practice of rotating That's right. their Senate seats. So he resigned in 1842 with a year left on his term. And another potential reason for his resignation was that back in Concord, Pierce had been persuaded to take a public temperance pledge yep. and became president of the State Temperance Association. Imagine that. But he, he holds true to it. He's gonna Yeah. He's not gonna drink for a while. Getting out of the Senate removes him from the temptation of his hard drinking crowd in Washington. That's right. When your wife doesn't want to be there because she hates it and your friends like all like hanging out with you and stuff, yeah. then it's gonna be easy to just fall back into the same old routine. Mm hmm But Pierce is for the time being determined not to let that happen. He's turning over a new leaf. That's it. He's back in New Hampshire. His law practice is flourishing. His reputation as a lawyer just continues to grow. Large audiences appear to hear him speak in court. I mean, he he's mystifying. Not only could you have had a Franklin Pierce Animal House, you could have had a Franklin Pierce Perry Mason. We're going to quote now from Peter Walner's more recent book on Franklin Pierce. Actually, I should clarify, it's a two-volume work. This is the first volume, New Hampshire's Favorite Son. And this is a little bit of Pierce in court. Quote, In the famous Wentworth murder case, Pierce's cross-examination of Eliza Jane Smith brought out that the woman was a prostitute who had abandoned her two illegitimate children. He also convinced the court that the woman had never been employed in the boarding house where she swore she had seen the accused return from the scene of the crime wearing a bloody shirt. Pierce demonstrated that the woman could not even recognize her so-called employer, whom Pierce cleverly seated directly before her in the courtroom. Pierce knew the law in each case, so that when he contested a legal point with a judge, he was usually upheld from the bench. These confrontations, however, were always done with the greatest respect, so that even when he lost a point, he made the jury feel that he was right and the court was wrong. Case closed, Franklin Pierce. That's right. Prosecution bringing in some prostitute to lie. Yep. Pierce is going to get to the bottom of it. Yep, and he sure did. Made mm -hmm. her look like a fool. Well, he's not only being a lawyer, he's also now the chairman of the New Hampshire State Democratic Committee. That's right. His goal, maintain party unity. Which was hard because the Whig Party was not all that strong in New Hampshire. Yeah. And it's the challenge is to maintain party unity when the opposition is weak. When the opposition is strong, it fosters your own party unity. Because you have to remain united or die. That's it. But with a weak Whig Party, Pierce has got to maintain party loyalty. And he would not tolerate any criticism of slavery in the party. Twice he called special sessions of the state Democratic Convention to remove candidates from the ticket after they expressed anti slavery sentiments. That's right. Including John Hale, who denounced the eighteen forty four Democratic Party platform that favored annexing Texas. A few years later, much to Pierce's chagrin, Hale would end up as the US Senator from New Hampshire as a member of the Liberty Party and Free Soil Party. Yeah. Also in 1844, Pierce campaigned hard for James K. Polk, a friend of his who had been Speaker when Pierce was in the House. And then as President, Polk named Pierce United States Attorney for New Hampshire. In 46, Polk asked Pierce to join the Cabinet as Attorney General, but Pierce declined, citing family responsibilities. Jane was still mourning the death of their son, Frank Robert, and still hated Washington, D.C., that's right. It is in this letter that Pierce says that he's not going to accept any public office except 
at the call of my country in time of war. And that time is drawing nigh. Yep. Because it's not too awful long later that the Mexican-American War breaks out. And Pierce, he's going to answer the call. He's getting the chance to follow in the footsteps of his revolutionary war hero father and his brothers who had fought in the War of 1812. Now, Pierce, he had had the cadets back in college. Yeah. He, I think, always relished the idea of military glory. Mm Mm-hmm. He was an officer in the state militia. Right. But he hadn't actually had active service. He takes it very seriously, though, and I, I think he is really initially excited. Mm-hmm. Yeah, this is a chance he's been waiting for. In early 1847, Congress created ten new regular army regiments. Polk appointed Pierce as a colonel and charged him with raising a regiment in New Hampshire. He was soon elevated to brigadier general and given command over a whole group of New England regiments that were going to join General Winfield Scott's invasion of Mexico. That's right. But by the time Pierce's regiments arrive in Mexico, Scott had already left Veracruz and was more than 100 miles inland. Yeah. So Pierce, he's got 2,500 men under his command, and he's there by himself pretty much. He has to put together transportation for his supplies and his artillery, and he leads his men on a perilous 21-day march through 150 miles of enemy territory. And by all accounts, he thrives here. Yeah. I mean, he really handles the he handles it well. His men came under attack six times but suffered few casualties, and Winfield Scott was very uh, laudatory of Pierce's skillful and determined leadership. Absolutely. Getting him getting his men to join up with the main force. And then Pierce's regiments, they're going to perform well. In several battles leading up to the capture of Mexico City, but Pierce's personal participation in these battles is pretty frustrating for him. Yeah, he's sadly not going to get the glory that he's been dreaming of. He's he's yearned for something that just isn't in the cards for him. Uh, There's a sad series of accidents here that lead to him missing out on some major battles. Yeah, at the Battle of Contreras, his horse was startled by artillery fire and fell, pinning his knee and severely injuring it. Some people had got the impression that Pierce had fainted, and one soldier said, General Pierce is a damned coward. That's not fair. Then he re-injured his knee in the next battle and missed the action. Then before the Battle of Churubusco, Scott ordered Pierce to convalesce. Pierce said, For God's sakes, General, this is the last great battle. I must lead my brigade. Pierce rode into battle tied to his horse, but the pain in his leg was so great that he passed out. And then at the Battle of Chapultepec, outside Mexico City, he was laid up in the sick tent with acute diarrhea. That's shitty. Literally. So injuries sidelined him for a lot of these battles. Yeah. Just some some bad luck. He tried. And the stories of his quote-unquote cowardice, those really don't even come out until 1852. Yeah, that's a smear <laughs> leveled against him yeah. in the presidential campaign. There wasn't anybody ripping on him. At the time. No. As we'll see right now, he got some uh, good praise from his fellow officers. Because once they made it to Mexico City, Pierce and the other officers formed a social club called the Aztec Club. Yeah. Which now featured... There's, there's a lot of big names in this yep. club. It's a lot of drinking and card playing. One time a drunken officer challenged Pierce to a duel, which he refused to fight. And, and among, that would be a story that came back to 
haunt Pearson 52 as well. Mm -hmm. And actually, the officer involved, I can't remember his first name. His last name was Magruder. And the story goes that, well, everybody was drunk. And they're gambling. And someone's accused of cheating. And an argument breaks out. And supposedly, Magruder said to Pierce, if you weren't my superior officer, I'd challenge you to a duel. And Pierce supposedly responded, hey, the war is pretty much over, man. <laughs> Let's go. Yeah. And it got heated, and they got pulled apart, and uh, Pierce was heading out the next day, and... Uh, Magruder actually uh, rode out, caught up with him, and apologized. Wow. And there wasn't any bad blood. In fact, later we'll talk about uh, a letter that Magruder writes but does not send to Pierce because of the way things are going. Mm. But that's down the road. Well, yeah, one of the casualties of the Mexican-American War Pierce's was sobriety. Pierce's temperance pledge yeah. did not make it. Another member of the Aztec Club, Ulysses S. Grant. Yeah. Which means the Aztec Club boasted our number one and number two drunkest presidents. Yeah, there was actually a lot of big names in there. McClellan hung out there. There was a whole yeah Civil War collective, really. Yeah. Guys that are going to go on to fight one, other, one another on the field of battle instead of mm -hmm. over a card table. Could be a follow-up to the Pierce Animal House movie. <laughs> yeah. In Mexico, Grant later wrote in his memoirs, whatever General Pierce's qualifications may have been for the presidency, he was a gentleman and a man of courage. I was not a supporter of him politically, but I knew him more intimately than I did any other of the volunteer generals. And that's pretty cool to hear from Grant, because Grant's not somebody to bullshit. No. In my opinion, when he says something, he pretty much means it. Yeah, well, the fighting's over. Pierce returned home to a hero's welcome. That's it. In New Hampshire. And back in New Hampshire, he campaigned for the Democrat Lewis Cass in 1848. Cass won New Hampshire by a strong margin. But Whig General Zachary Taylor took the presidency. Yep. In 1850, Taylor died. Millard Fillmore signed into law the Compromise of 1850, over which both parties had sharply divided along sectional lines. This is going to become very important for Pierce in a couple years. That's right. Most northern Democrats, including Pierce, supported the compromise as necessary to save the Union, while most northern Whigs saw it as a giveaway to southern slave owners. On the other hand, most southern Whigs supported the compromise as necessary to save the Union, while southern Democrats saw it as selling out southern interests. In the elections of 1850 and 51, the divided northern Whigs lost ground to Democrats while secessionist-leaning Southerners were defeated by Unionist candidates. That's right. So you got the Whig Party looking more hopelessly divided coming, than it ever has. Yep. Coming following in, the compromise. Coming into 1852, the Democrats like their chances in the next presidential election, but they feel they need a Northerner. Yeah. That's how they're going to preserve their own party unity. And the front runners going into the 52 convention are Lewis Cass, James Buchanan, and Stephen Douglas. But the relationships between those three are so rancorous that a lot of people are doubting whether any of them is going to be able to capture the two thirds majority needed to win the nomination. Yeah, I mean, they're pretty much ripping each other apart there. Uh, yeah. Stephen well, Douglas, I mean, you're starting to see the Young America movement yeah. coming up here. Yeah, Cass and, and Buchanan are pretty old. They're considered old guard. Douglas is the, the new generation. 
Well, who else you got? You got Levi Woodbury, who Pierce had studied law under. He'd become a Supreme Court justice. He's New Hampshire's favorite son. Yeah. But September 1851, Levi Woodbury dies. Yeah. And now Pierce is New Hampshire's favorite son. Jane Pierce is appalled by talk of her husband's name being mentioned in the in the convention. Yeah, she is not at all thrilled at Pierce, this prospect. Pierce published a letter stating that it would be, quote, would be utterly repugnant to my tastes and wishes for his name to be put forth at the convention. But some supporters believe Pierce will be the perfect compromise candidate and they propose a strategy whereby his name will not be mentioned at all unless and until it is clear that the convention is hopelessly deadlocked. And without Jane's knowledge, Pierce agreed to let his friends at the convention use their best judgment. Now, there is a lot of debate about Pierce's actual role in these proceedings. Mm -hmm. There's... Some people would say, he, he well, he didn't have anything to do with it. He backed off and let his friends kind of run things. But there's others that say Pierce might have been really behind this whole thing. Hmm. That it was all part of a plan to get the nomination. And that he pretty cleverly saw it through. Now that's up for debate. Yeah, I mean, he. This is kind of what uh, how Polk got the nomination in '44 for the Democrats. And I think for, it could be said for both of them. They definitely knew what was going on. Yeah. But did Jane know what was going on? That's the thing that sticks in the back of my mind. Is he knows how much she hates this. Mm -hmm. So for him to be actively working towards this yeah. is completely <laughs> against yeah. his marriage. <laughs> Especially after he published a letter stating that it would be utterly repugnant for him to be considered. Yeah. I'm sure that letter got Jane off his back, but then was he still and was it a ruse? doing things behind her back? In any event, as expected, the convention in Baltimore was deadlocked for three days and over 30 ballots. Yeah. On the 35th ballot, Virginia voted for Franklin Pierce. New Hampshire and Maine joined Virginia on the next ballot. And then on the 46th ballot, Kentucky added its support for Pierce. On the 49th ballot, North Carolina switched to Pierce, setting off a landslide in his favor and clinching him the nomination. So the second dark horse now. Yep. Following the footsteps of James K. Polk is Franklin Pierce here. For vice president, the convention nominated Senator William Rufus King of Alabama, a close ally of Buchanan, to appease the disappointed Buchanan faction. Yeah, I just want to say that uh, because we've talked about him a little bit before, a close second in these vice presidential machinations was Gideon Pillow. Wow. Very nearly could have been a Pierce Pillow ticket. Because what? actually, initially, they had talked about a Pillow Pierce ticket. Yeah, that's what Pillow thought. Yeah, the, it's, an, it's an interesting convention. <laughs> that would have been something. Yeah. Gideon Pillow is president. Yeah. Wow. Gideon Pillow not on the top five would be president's list. Mm hmm. He's on a top list all of his own. He, yeah, he's number one on his own <laughs> list. <laughs> yeah. Well, the party platform endorsed the Compromise of 1850 as the final settlement of the slavery question and pledged support for the Fugitive Slave Act. That's going to become important as well. Yeah. The final settlement yeah, of the slavery question. Over and done forever and die. The Pierces were in Boston during the convention, and Pierce was reportedly shocked when he received word that he had been nominated. Jane straight up fainted. Yeah. Yeah, the story is they were in a carriage, and a guy rode up to him and said, Have you heard about what happened at the convention? And Pierce is like, No. And he's like, Well, you won't believe who was nominated. And 
Pierce is basically like, I haven't the foggiest. And he was like, it's none other than you yourself. <laughs> and he said that Pierce kind of like sat back and Jane straight up passed out. Yeah. Just fainted, dead away. She's not thrilled. No. Seems like Pierce persuaded her to accept the situation only by arguing that if he became president, their 11-year-old son, Benny Pierce, would have much greater prospects for a successful life. Yeah. Well, that's the Democratic nomination. How about the Whigs? At the Whig convention, the mostly northern supporters of Winfield Scott felt that the party platform had to remain silent about the Compromise of 1850 to avoid alienating northern Whigs, but the supporters of Fillmore and Daniel Webster formed a majority. They made sure the party platform declared support for the Compromise, much like the Democrat platform. This right. Compromise is the final settlement of the slavery issue. And our seasoned listeners will remember... All of this drama from last episode on Millard Fillmore. Yeah, boy, what a what a heated little event. Yeah, that Fillmore Webster majority couldn't agree on which one of them should be the nominee, and after a lengthy deadlock, the convention ended up choosing Winfield Scott. But the Southern Whigs hated Scott, and the Northern Whigs now hated the pro compromise platform. Yeah. So Scott is looking dead in the water. Yeah. Pierce going head to head with his commanding officer from the war. That's it. And that's pretty much this is where all of your Pierce is a coward. Uh Pierce is a drunk. All of that stuff is this is where it really comes yep. out because nobody had really said too much before. Yeah, he's he's criticized as an obscure and unknown individual. And they're attacking, yeah, his war record and his drinking. He's called, quote, hero of many a well-fought bottle. Yeah. A Boston Whig newspaper said that Pierce was nominated only because of, quote, his complete and abject devotion to the demands of the South. No man has ever earned for himself more deservedly the reputation of a most thorough-paced doe face. But none of these attacks really gain any traction, Pierce followed the old school tradition, doing no personal campaigning. And Pierce has a little bit of an added bonus in check yeah, for this campaign. We mentioned traditional his tra- college click. Yeah, tra- before traditionally you put up, put out you're running for president, you put out a campaign biography. Who's Pierce going to get to write his campaign biography? His lifelong college friend, Nathaniel Hawthorne, author of The Scarlet Letter, Twice Told Tales, The Marble Fawn, and many more. And now, the campaign biography of Franklin Pierce. Yeah. Added to his repertoire. Yeah, and Hawthorne eventually is going to find himself at odds with his New England literary circle because he staunchly defends Franklin Pierce to the end. Mm -hmm. Nathaniel Hawthorne and Franklin Pierce were true besties. Yeah. There was actually, there was a tree in... uh, Where was it? I thought it was in New Hampshire, not at the not at Bowdoin College, but in New Hampshire, where Hawthorne was visiting him once, and they carved their initials into a tree, and like it was there for a long time, and was like a tourist spot. Wow! Like near the old Pierce homestead, I think. Yeah, we'll be getting a little more into their friendship later. Yeah, at yeah, this point, it's lifelong. Yeah. The Whigs are not looking too good in this election. This is generally an un- unenthusiastic election on both sides a little bit. Voter turnout at its lowest since 1836 and would not be this low again until the 1920s. Pierce, he wins 51% of the popular vote versus 44% for Scott, 5% for the Free Soil Party candidate John P. Hale. 
whom Pierce had previously run out of the New Hampshire Democratic Party. Yeah, that's right, over the Texas annexation issue. But Pierce is going to win all but four states and dominate the Electoral College 254 to 42. The, the biggest landslide victory up to that time. Wow. Democrats also expand their majority in both houses of Congress. It's now, once again, good to be a Democrat. Yep. But sadly, in Pierce's case, things are going to be looking brightest before the dark. Yep. Pierce has got uh, some months to go before his inauguration, and what happens? Well, December 1852... Jane Pierce's uncle died, and the Pierce family traveled to Boston for the funeral on their way back to Concord. Their train car derailed and rolled down a 20-foot embankment landing on its roof. Pierce was badly bruised, but he and Jane survived. However, their 11-year-old son, Benny, was sitting alone in the seat behind them and had the back of his head sheared off. He died instantly. Yeah. The scene was pretty much carnage, as you could imagine. There's shattered glass. There's people bleeding and moaning. And nobody appears to be hurt initially. There's passengers coming out. And there was a preacher that was on the train that wrote an account of what had happened and he said that he had made his way out through a window and turned around and looked at the scene he was had a he was bleeding and another guy came out and thanked god that that everyone was alive he said we're alive but not everyone meanwhile inside the train Pierce comes to and looks around for his son, and upon first glance, he seems maybe shocked because he's facing him, and when he goes over to grab him, he sees that the back and top of his head's been crushed. Mm -hmm. Something fell and just smashed it. Yeah. And... He goes to throw his cloak over the body, but Jane sees it. And the reverend in his account says that he'll never be able to forget her inhuman cries of anguish. And he said that it was unbelievable that Franklin Pierce was able to be there for her to console her because he was Mm. obviously destroyed I mean but she was beyond the beyond in terms of her grief there they take the body back to a nearby barn and they sit in there with it pretty much during the night Pierce trying to console Jane as best he can which is going to prove impossible Mm -hmm. for anybody She's never going to come back from this. No. She was so devastated. She didn't even go to the funeral. She didn't go to Washington for the inauguration. She wondered whether the accident was divine punishment for her husband's pursuit of high office. Yeah. She would pen letters to Benny, apologizing for her faults as a mother. I mean, she she went off the deep end. Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah, she spent most of her time as First Lady, secluded in the upstairs living quarters. Didn't make her first public appearance as First Lady until two years into her husband's term. Her cousin, Abby Means, handled most of the duties as social hostess. Yeah, Jane Pierce uh, does get credit for being the First Lady to install a White House Christmas tree. That's one thing she was able to do and I can't help but think that in doing that she was thinking of her son the whole time Mm -hmm. yeah this is just one of the most if not the most devastating tragedy ever to befall an incoming president a president yeah 
Um, yeah, this you figure like this guy has this happen, and then he has to go be president now. Yeah, I mean he had lost two kids already. Benny mm-hmm. was it. Yeah, he's eleven. They're not going to have any more kids. Yeah, they're like and with fifty him years gone, old now. This is it. With him gone, that's it. That's the end of the line there. Mm-hmm. And they had a lot of hope for him because he was a really intelligent kid. Like, there's the one letter. There's a couple letters of his that survive, but in the one that he writes his uncle, uh, he says, you'll have to pardon the brevity, the brevity of my letter, but my pen is filled with anything but ink. <laughs> you know, he's a bright kid. Yeah. You know, and he, he very easily could have become a lawyer and gotten into politics, mm-hmm. like, and fo- followed in Pierce's footsteps. You know, so it, it's it's an almost unbelievable kind of feeling. Yeah, that Pierce would be at heading into the presidency. Yeah, yeah. Andrew Jackson, his wife Rachel died. Yeah, after his election, before his inauguration, and that would be hard. But I don't think there's anything tougher than a parent no. losing a child. Yeah, through a violent accident right in front of your face yeah and then not only yeah as hard as this is on pierce personally and he has to be there for jane who's yeah even more devastated and she that just probably totally hurts loses him it. even more because he knows that as president he's not going to be able to be there for her as much as she needs yeah and that's why they have her cousin abby means come with them and it's pretty much her responsibility to look after Jane and she has there's letters that survive of her where she writes to family back home saying like I don't know how much longer I could deal with this because she's inconsolable she's just not willing to even try I mean she was destroyed and you know you think of Mary Lincoln went through that but still she functioned as a white house hostess and kind of enjoyed it really yeah well yeah she enjoyed the politics of it jane hated that whole thing to begin with and now she has to go do it in this bereavement it's just unimaginable yeah it's it's almost unthinkable well franklin pierce is heading into the presidency with a very dark cloud hanging over his family and you know there are also dark clouds gathering over the nation yeah we'll see how he handles it right after these words from our sponsors the dead president's podcast is brought to you in part by edward wadsworth who publishes this important notice Whereas my wife, Eliza Wadsworth, has left my bed and board without any just cause whatever, I forbid all persons harboring or trusting her on my account. I hope she will come back and live with me, and I will be good and keep sober. Well, there you have it, listeners. Bit of a mixed message from our sponsor, Edward Wadsworth. He claims Eliza left without cause, but pretty much admits to having a drinking problem. Clearly, there's been some trouble in paradise, but this marriage is not beyond salvation. Eliza, while you've probably heard this from Edward before, this time, things will be different. He'll sign a temperance pledge, just like Franklin Pierce. Give him one more chance, and he'll be sober as a judge. That's an ironclad promise from our sponsor, Edward Wadsworth. Now an important message from our sponsor, George Hodges. Whereas my sleeping partner, James D. Wilson, has left my bed and board without just cause or provocation, this notice is to forbid all persons from harboring him on my account, as I shall pay no debts of his contracting after this date. We here at the Dead Presidents Podcast are nothing if not open-minded. We fully support George Hodges and James Wilson's sleeping arrangement even though it is the 1850s 
and we support George's right to be off the hook for James's debts now that they're no longer sleeping together. We think James may soon regret walking out on George, who is quite a catch, and should have no trouble finding a new sleeping partner who will actually appreciate him. <clears throat> That's a message from our sponsor, George Hodges. Now a word from our sponsor, John Woodward. My wife, Louisa Woodward, a colored person, having left my bed and board and her three small children without my consent and approbation, I hereby forewarn all persons against either harboring or employing her in any manner or form whatever. The said Louisa Woodward, being mine both by marriage and purchase, I am determined to enforce the law against any and all persons who may disregard this notice. Now, wait a minute here. I don't think we thoroughly vetted this ad. Yeah. We thought this was another of our typical bed and board cuckvertisements, but it looks like it violates our strict policy against running fugitive slave ads. Indeed. This puts us in a bit of a pickle. As unapologetic misogynists, we can't help but think a wife's place is at home under her husband's thumb, but as ardent abolitionists, we fully support Louise's efforts to run away from her supposed owner. You know what? John Woodward can have his money back, because we're going to go ahead and encourage our listeners to harbor Louisa on her road to freedom. This has not been a message from John Woodward. Amen. And now back to the show. And we're back and ready to dive head first into the presidency of Franklin Pierce. Now, as you remember from before the break, Pierce is not coming into this in a great way. But he performs a pretty remarkable feat at his inauguration, delivering his inaugural address completely from memory without the use of notes, something that has not been done before nor since. And that's an impressive statement in regards to Pierce's mental acumen that he was able to do that, given the weight that was on him yeah. at the time. And he began, You have summoned me in my weakness. You must sustain me with your strength. Yep. Yeah. Well, Pierce is going to have a tough task ahead of him. He sure is. Given the way things uh, are coming out of the compromise of 1850 it's a delicate balance here yeah let's start off talking about pierce uh in the realm of foreign policy before some of those sticky domestic issues heat back up that's pierce right is doing a lot of stuff on the international stage yeah uh first off uh let's talk about the gadsden purchase this actually goes pretty well this is going to help to complete a southern route for a transcontinental railroad. It's a big hunk of land in New Mexico and Arizona territory. And this is going to end up completing the contiguous border of the United States as we know it today. Yeah. Yeah, the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo, which ended the Mexican-American War, provided for a joint commission to determine the exact border west of Texas, where the Rio Grande was the border. Trying to figure out the rest of the border, there are discrepancies between maps and surveys that are creating problems. Yeah, as you know from episode 12, Taylor actually has to threaten to hang some people. Yeah. Well, in terms of the uh, border between the United States and Mexico, during the Fillmore administration... Southerners in Congress blocked the approval of a border that would have given to Mexico the Mesilla Valley, which is in what is now southern New Mexico and Arizona, 
That's a strip of desert that's vital to Southerners' plans for a railroad running from Texas to San Diego. When Pierce has taken office, William Lane, the governor of New Mexico Territory, angers Mexico by issuing a proclamation claiming that the Mesilla Valley is part of New Mexico. Pierce replaced Lane, but then he appointed James Gadsden as the new envoy to Mexico with instructions to acquire the Mesilla Valley. Gadsden was the former president of the South Carolina Railroad Company and a slave owner who advocated South Carolina's secession when California was admitted as a free state. Ouch. Gadsden then advocated splitting California into two states and planned to start a slaveholding colony in Southern California and build a railroad with slave labor. Guy sounds like a real jerk. Well... He's going to work with the Mexican government, which under Santa Ana was strapped for cash and was in fear of having more of its territory simply snatched away for nothing by aggressive Americans. The region was also suffering from brutal raids by Apaches and Comanches, and Mexico was seeking reparations from the United States, which had been supposed to protect against Indian raids under the treaty and was not able to do so. Gadsden was authorized to offer up to $50 million to acquire Baja California and more, and he advised Santa Ana that he better sell Mexico's northwestern states while he still could, because they would eventually secede. And at the same time, there was an unsanctioned American filibuster expedition under William Walker that had invaded Baja California and was trying to declare the state of Sonora independent from Mexico. So that's kind of the gun we have to Mexico's head in terms of negotiations on this. Yeah. Santa Ana agreed to sell only 38,000 square miles of the Mesilla Valley, not to sell Baja California and the rest of it. But the Senate could not get a two-thirds majority to ratify this treaty because Northerners weren't too enamored of this southern route for a transcontinental railroad. Not too keen on it. And they don't want to acquire even more territory that could be potentially slave state territory. The Senate ended up altering the treaty and ratified a different version that only acquired 29,000 square miles of land for $10 million. I have altered the deal. Pray I don't alter it any further. Well, just like Lando Calrissian, Santa Ana has to take what he can get. That's it. And accepted the revised treaty, which went into effect in June 1854. Well, Franklin Pierce is a good, solid Democrat, as opposed to federally funded internal improvements, so that's not helping getting a railroad built there. Right. And then you got the Civil War coming up to intervene. You're not going to get a railroad built through that area until the 1880s. But yeah, now the continental United States are complete. That's it. So why don't we look abroad? How are things looking elsewhere in the world? Secretary of State William Marcy negotiated a treaty with Britain that increased trade reciprocity with Canada, granted New England fishermen access to waters off Nova Scotia and Newfoundland, and allowed some Canadian products, including coal, to enter the United States duty-free. Pierce named James Buchanan minister to Britain, and in his 1855 State of the Union address, argued that Britain was violating the 1850 clayton Bulwer Treaty by occupying territory in Honduras and Nicaragua, where both the British and the United States hoped to establish a canal. Flashback to episode 13. Buchanan reported that Pierce's forceful speech caused the British to reevaluate their Central American policy, though it wouldn't be until a few years after Pierce left office that Britain would give up its occupation. Yeah. Pierce laying down the law. Yeah. Sounds like uh, the Monroe Doctrine. Yeah, Fillmore was kind of unable to do that, as we heard in episode 13, where we talked about 
We could have at least had a potential railroad, but just not in the cards. Here's at least it looks like made an impact here. Yeah. And the, we mentioned earlier William Walker. That's right. In 1853, William Walker of Tennessee invaded Baja, California with 45 men, tried to establish a secessionist republic comprising Baja, California, and Sonora, but lack of supplies forced him to retreat back to California, where he was put on trial for violating the Neutrality Act, but he was acquitted by a sympathetic jury. But he's not done, because in 1855, Walker invaded Nicaragua, which was in the midst of a civil war, with 60 men who were soon joined by hundreds of locals. He defeated one of the warring factions and captured the major city of Granada and ruled through a puppet president. In May 1856, President Pierce recognized Walker's government as the legitimate government of Nicaragua. And to curry favor with Southerners, Walker legalized slavery in Nicaragua. Wow. In July of 1856, Walker was inaugurated president. In the uh, neighboring country of Costa Rica... They're looking over at Nicaragua, and they're afraid that they're going to become the target of further conquest. So they assembled an army, which ended up defeating Walker. By the following spring, Walker fled and surrendered to a U.S. Navy vessel. When Walker returned to Central America in 1860, the British Royal Navy delivered him to authorities in Honduras, which executed him by firing squad. That was the end of him. Yeah. I think there's a book about the, him. I think it's called William Walker's Wars. Yeah. I mean, that's on my uh, list of books to check out. It's pretty wild. Yeah, pretty wild character. Well, Pierce recognizing his government. Yeah. Which, yeah, that kind of thing brings us to Cuba where That's right. a similar thing had been attempted in Cuba during the Taylor and Fillmore administrations. Well, and even going back to Polk, Polk offered to buy Cuba, mm -hmm. and the Spanish refused. Yeah. Taylor and Fillmore, you have Americans participating in these failed attempts to start something down there. Yeah, some Americans being more executed by firing squad in Cuba yeah. as well. See, Southerners want Cuba as a slave state. They're trying to maintain the balance between slave and free. They got their eyes on Cuba. And I think, as you said in the last episode, it is a place that slavery already exists, so you're not creating slavery in a new place like as an appeasement tactic to you know maybe if that had been on the table sooner yeah. it could have cooled tensions but god what a deplorable thing to think well they're not giving up on Cuba even though early in Pierce's term the new Spanish governor general of Cuba announced an intention to free Cuba's slaves which shocked and outraged American Southerners. Yeah, because that makes sense. Well, they're trying to acquire a new slave state. Can't have it go freeing its slaves. The governor general also seized an American merchant ship and demanded it pay import duties on its cotton cargo, even though the cotton was bound for New York and wasn't being imported into Cuba. Pierce administration instructed its new minister to Spain, Pierre Soleil of Louisiana, to demand imde indemnification for the merchant vessel, but the Spanish were stonewalling. Pierce requested exigency funds from Congress, which some speculated might fund a naval expedition against Cuba. There was another potential filibuster expedition assembling under former Mississippi governor John Quitman, but Pierce ordered it to disperse. Pierce considered offering $130 million to purchase Cuba, 
but that plan was dropped. Pierce ordered Soleil to meet with Buchanan and John Y. Mason, who was minister to France, to develop a new plan for acquiring Cuba. The three ministers met in Ostend, Belgium, and drafted a report to the Secretary of State that provided no new plan for acquiring Cuba, but it suggested that if Spanish control of Cuba was a threat to the United States, then the United States would be justified in seizing it by force. In the meantime, Spain had replaced its governor general and reversed the plan to free Cuba's slaves. And though the report to the Secretary of State, which became known as the Ostend Manifesto, did not actually recommend seizing Cuba, when it was leaked to the press in 1855, Northerners denounced it as a warmongering plan to benefit southern slave owners. It was also denounced by Spain, Britain, and France. Pierce was forced to abandon plans to acquire Cuba, and Pierre Soleil resigned. Yeah, not, not a, exactly no. looking good here. No. The Cuba policy kind of went awry. But hey, Franklin Pierce has uh, the domestic sphere to shine in. We'll see. Right? Well, how's his cabinet looking? See, Pierce, Pierce's top priority is maintaining Democratic Party unity. Yeah, and he goes against he goes against the advice of Martin Van Buren and James Buchanan, who he writes to and asks advice on selection of the cabinet. And they both say, first and foremost, don't try and appoint somebody from every faction because nobody will ever get along and it's going to be an absolute disaster. Pierce ignores them both and he does just that mm -hmm. and he has a really factionally balanced cabinet in terms of the Democratic Party the only faction not being represented in the cabinet is the Stephen A. Douglas faction mm-hmm Well, that might lead to some trouble later. Yeah, well, just because everyone's in the cabinet doesn't mean that the country's happy or that the party's happy. See, Pierce, in trying to maintain party unity, has the same problem he had in the New Hampshire Democratic Party, which is that the Whig opposition is so weak. Yeah. After Pierce won in a landslide, the Tennessee Democrat, future president, Andrew Johnson wrote, The Whig Party is now disbanded, leaving the Democratic Party without external pressure to keep it together. Yeah. Yeah, he was right. So Pierce has oh, got... Yeah. There's, you know, the Democratic Party has Northerners with anti-slavery leanings, and they've got Southerners with secessionist leanings, and that's what Pierce has to try to hold together. Pierce's cabinet had you know, pro-compromise Northerners, and it had anti-compromise Southerners, including War Secretary Jefferson Davis. That's right. A close personal friend of the Pierce's. Jefferson and Verena Davis mm -hmm. would oft mingle with the Pierce's. And in fact, when Jefferson Davis's son Samuel died, it was the Pierce's that really were there for him and his wife mm -hmm. more than anybody else, although Jane was so torn up by Samuel Davis's death that she couldn't attend the funeral and kind of went off again wow. Wow. into her melancholy. He, he, uh, I mean, they, they've hung out. Mm -hmm. The Davises and the Pierces, and Jane in particular, really seemed to be happy when Samuel Davis was around. Mm -hmm. Any, it, it was said of Jane that, like any young 
my child that like was around, she would kind of a switch would be flipped and she'd be just wonderful. But again, no avoiding the icy clutches of creeping death. Yeah. Well, I guess you know, Davis served in the Mexican-American War, so he probably knew Pierce from there. That's right. Yeah, Pierce is trying to hold together this party, but there's all kind of different factions, particularly in New York. You have the Barnburner faction that supported Martin Van Buren in 1848 in his free soil candidacy. And then you've got the Hunker faction which is uh, favoring silence on slavery. That faction has its own split between the hard shells and the soft shells. And Pierce, he appointed the soft shell William Marcy as Secretary of State, trying to keep balance. You got the Collector of Customs in New York, which is the best patronage appointment in the federal government. The Marcy, of course, had been in Polk's cabinet. Yeah. Collector of Customs controls a lot of lucrative posts underneath of it. Yeah. Trying to keep balance, Pierce appoints a hard shell to that post, but he stipulates that the appointments need to be spread evenly among all three New York factions. That's not followed. Those factions are at each other's throats. And that's the problem with the Democratic Party. Some of the leaders feel like they need a sharply partisan issue that will unite the Whigs against them and thereby let the Democrats unite. But there doesn't seem to be that kind of issue out there. Like, I was thinking about it. What issue could they do? What were the partisan issues before? The bank, the tariff, internal improvements... Yeah. The, the Democrats won the bank issue and the tariff issue. Like, that's dead. So they can't, yeah. they can't kill the bank again. So now you kind of harken back again to last episode and you look at people like Thurlow Weed who are trying to create yeah. a new party around a single issue. Yeah. As he had off done. Mm -hmm. You know, we talked about weed with the anti-Masonic party. And uh, what we're going to start seeing here. Yeah, well, that's the problem. The one hot button issue doesn't uh, create a partisan split. It creates a sectional split. That's right. There's nothing left that can unite northern and southern Democrats on one side and northern and southern Whigs on the other side. Yeah. But that's what they're going to try to do. I guess that was their goal with what is about to happen. But yeah, it seems uh, it does, it it's hard to see how they thought it out. was going to work out that way. So Stephen Douglas, he's going to step out on the stage. He's got an idea. You got Nebraska. That's an unincorporated territory that's west of Missouri and Iowa. It was part of the Louisiana Purchase. It's also north of the Missouri Compromise Line, which under the 1820 Missouri Compromise, slavery was banned north of that line. You got a lot of farmers interested in settling that territory. You also got railroad promoters that want to organize the territory. But yeah, a lot of people feel like there's a lot of money to be made yeah, out here. You can, yeah, you can get this, this is territory all just part going. Of, like this is like what expansion was all about. Mm -hmm. Like we need to like, yeah, take this. So what's the problem with incorporating Nebraska? Well, well. Southerners <laughs> won't agree uh, to incorporate a territory that will reaffirm the Missouri Compromise ban on slavery. That was an issue that we thought was decided way back in 1820. But if they create a new territory there, they're going to have to reaffirm that, and they won't do that. And again, just calling out more bullshit on people living in like Georgia and Alabama and Arkansas that thought mm -hmm. 
Well, we have to have slavery and yeah. Uh, well, you got people in Missouri, which is a slave state, who are afraid that if there's a free state next door, their slaves will run away <laughs> into a free state. But um, hey, you got the there's Stephen Douglas's idea. We just had the Compromise of eighteen fifty. And it left the question of slavery in the territories of New Mexico and Utah up to the popular sovereignty of those territories' residents. So Stephen Douglas thinks, hey, maybe we can organize Nebraska along those lines. And he started arguing that that popular sovereignty principle of the Compromise of 1850 had been intended to apply to all territories... And he thinks that this will create the partisan split that they're hoping for. He thinks that Whigs can unite against this, with Southern Whigs opposing it on the ground that it's highly unlikely slavery will establish in, in Nebraska, and that Northern uh, Democrats will support it for that same reason. Well... He's seriously misjudging the way things are going to work out. <laughs> yeah. Well, January 22nd, 1854, Stephen Douglas goes to the White House to secure Franklin Pierce's support. And who else is there? None other than Jefferson Davis. Yep. And that's not all, because he's got seven powerful Southern Democrats from Congress there. Yeah. And Pierce is going to come out of the meeting an ardent supporter of this bill. And, I mean, he works for it. Mm -hmm. There's no beating around the bush here. Pierce works for this bill. Well, some historians think that he, you know, basically agreed with Stephen Douglas about the Compromise of 1850 and popular sovereignty on the issue of slavery and also agreed with Douglas that this would create Democratic Party unity. Sure. And, of course, he'd also be afraid to piss off these guys because yeah. he's got some stuff still on the table, still pending. Yeah, the that, Gadsden Treaty and the Britain Treaty are right. still pending at this if, time. If he goes against these guys, those might be DOA. Yeah. Well, in any event, yeah, Pierce is going to be supporting this. Steve, The bill Stephen Douglas puts together is going to establish two territories out of Nebraska, which would be Kansas and Nebraska. That's going to create an impression that there's a balance here. Right. Because the northernmost Nebraska is going to be free. But there's a possibility that maybe Kansas might become a slave state. Yeah. And, uh, you know, their hope that this would be a partisan issue and not a sectional issue was shattered almost immediately. Yeah, just straight off the bat, forget about it. You have people flooding into the contested area. Well, as soon as this is proposed, anti-slavery Democrats from the North don't get on board with it like Douglas thought they might. They immediately issue a manifesto denouncing it as an atrocious plot to spread slavery and to exclude northern whites from the new territory. They're casting the issue as one of southern aggression, which is now forcing southern Whigs to support it, Yeah, where Douglas and Pierce were thinking they would oppose. And now free soil Democrats are opposing it. It just didn't go at all the way they seem to think it would. Yeah. But I can't imagine them being confident in that. Like, can you, like, honestly, like, they really thought that that was going to work? I don't know. That just I seems they did. so far-reaching. <laughs> yeah, because see, the Democratic Party platform of 1852 endorsed the Compromise of 1850 as the final settlement of the slavery issue, and Pierce had vowed not to let the issue reemerge during his presidency. And then, here they are with this. Yeah. 
And I mean, this is uh, this is in your face. Yeah, they're proposing to repeal the Missouri Compromise, right. while at the same time claiming that the Compromise of 1850 had already a- repealed the Missouri Compromise, which is not going to fly with a lot of people, especially no. those who didn't weren't big fans of the of the Compromise of 1850. And there were a lot of them. Yeah, they're now claiming well. Pretty much everybody found something they hated in the Compromise of 1850, one way or another. Anti-slavery Northerners, you know, weren't a fan of it. And now that they're saying, well, hey, popular sovereignty for territories as to whether slavery, like, that's what we all agreed on, that's not what they all agreed on. Right. Some Northerners, you know, stomached that as to a couple very specific territories... They didn't agree that that's the principle overall. So they're trying to create, you know, open a vast new territory to the potential of slavery while not really, while trying to claim that this is an issue that had already been decided in 50 when it was clearly not. Yep, we just pretty much opened up a whole new fresh can of worms here. Yeah. Well, Pierce is on board with it. He wrote that the Missouri Compromise had been superseded by the principles of the Compromise of 1850 and is hereby declared inoperative and void. Residents of any territory were perfectly free to form and regulate their institutions in their own way. This act is going to pass narrowly through both houses of Congress along sharply sectional lines. Yeah. You got Southern Whigs supporting it and Northern Democrats opposing it. And this is going to spark a major party realignment. Yeah. This is really the final straw of the Whig party. Yeah. The Whigs are done now. Northern Whigs, Midwestern Whigs, they're done with Southern Whigs. And they're going to start forming their own party... It's going to be called the Republican Party. Yeah. And then in the Northeast, a lot of Whigs and Northern Democrats are joining the new American Party, the Know Nothing Party. That's right. In the elections of 1854 and 55, the Democratic Party is wiped out in the North. They lose almost three-quarters of their northern seats in Congress, including every seat in Pierce's native New Hampshire. Yeah. Now that is a telling blow. Yeah. And I'm sure Pierce felt that one personal. Yeah. After having kept New Hampshire united for so long to see it fall that hard. Mm Mm-hmm. Must have been crushing, but... More crushing is what the Kansas-Nebraska Act is going to inflict upon the country. It leads directly to what is known as Bleeding Kansas, one of the darkest moments pre-Civil War Mm -hmm. in our country's history. Upon its organization as a territory, it immediately becomes a slavery battleground you have people from both sides flooding into the territory determined to take over this new territorial government yeah popular sovereignty the territorial government's going to decide whether there's slavery there or not and abolitionists and slaveholders both want to control it then it leads to direct violence yeah, Pierce appointed as governor of Kansas Andrew Reeder of Pennsylvania, who was more interested in enriching himself through, through speculation. Land speculation. Yeah, guy who doesn't actually give a shit. So there's a first. Ouch. Yeah. So when you have the first territorial legislative election in March 1855, hundreds of heavily armed Missourians the so-called border ruffians enter Kansas to vote for pro-slavery candidates and cast hundreds of fictitious ballots. 
pro-slavery legislature was elected which outlawed abolitionist literature, made harboring a fugitive slave punishable by 10 years hard labor, and required office holders to take an oath that slavery would remain forever legal in Kansas. Ludicrous. The minority of anti-slavery legislatures res- resigned and abolitionists formed a rival government in Topeka, right. which Pierce denounced as an insurrectionist regime. Again, bad luck. A congressional committee determined that the pro-slavery elections were fraudulent and that if only actual settlers had been allowed to vote, a free soil majority would have been elected. Pierce ignored the committee's findings and yeah. continued to recognize the pro-slavery government. The U.S. Army arrested the governor of the quote-unquote free state insurrectionist government and disbanded its legislature. Yeah. And the battle for Kansas just continues to erupt mm-hmm. into more and more widespread violence in May 1856. Yeah, this you have pro-slavery forces destroying two newspaper offices and burning a hotel in Lawrence, Kansas. Yeah, I think they were firing artillery yeah. at a hotel. This May 1856 seems like just about the darkest period uh, yet. I think this all Indeed. happens in one week. Cause, because this, later that week, yeah. you get John Brown really making a name for himself. Mm -hmm. He and his followers are going to retaliate to these events by capturing five pro-slavery men and hacking them to death with swords. Yeah. Not to mention, same week... Senator Charles Sumner of Massachusetts, who denounced the Kansas-Nebraska Act and lambasted South Carolina Senator Andrew Butler as a pimp for slavery and mocked the speech impediment Butler incurred from a stroke. Two days later... Butler's distant cousin, Representative Preston Brooks, entered the Senate chamber and beat Charles Sumner almost to death with a cane. Yeah. In one of the most infamous, if not the most infamous, uh, outbreak of violence on the floor of the Senate. We talked about Benton in the last episode. We had pistols brandished. Yeah. But this... This is just this, beyond the pale. I don't think this has happened since the Lion Griswold affair back before even the Continental Congress. Yeah. Well, what happens to Preston Brooks after he beats Charles Sumner almost to death? He gets praise from Southern Democrats. Yeah. He is not removed from the House, and he he's, gets re-elected. He's re-elected. Yep. His constituents are fans of that. Kansas continues to degenerate into gang violence and guerrilla warfare, which continued for years, even after Pierce left office. Yeah, and this is going to result in an estimated 50 to 200 deaths. Yeah. It's pretty much the onset of civil war. Yeah, it's it's like a little mini pre-civil war. Yeah. It really is. And and in the light of this, Pierce is trying to seek renomination in 1856. Yeah, you have pretty much like the worst week ever in yeah. May 1856. June is the Democratic Convention where Pierce is trying to get renominated. Yeah. And it's pretty much immediately not looking good. Yeah, because Democrats, they want to win the upcoming election, and Pierce could not be more unpopular in the North. Yeah, and we've just, as we've said, there's been a pretty major party realignment in the wake of all that's going on here. Yeah, the Democratic Party's on life support in the North. Yeah. And putting Pierce back on there is not going to 
get it back together. No, he just is not going to cut the butter. But he's, you know, he's still on on the ballot in the convention. First ballot at the convention, he gets 122 votes against 135 for Buchanan, 33 for Stephen Douglas. On the sixth ballot, Tennessee switched from Pierce to Buchanan, which set off a slow exodus of his support. It's kind of interesting to think, because we had talked about before with Stephen Douglas representing the Young America faction, and yeah. James Buchanan and Lewis Cass being looked at as like the old guard that were over the hill, mm-hmm. that now, after this major party realignment and all this shifting going on, the Democrats will actually look to Buchanan as the best case scenario. Yeah, well, D- Douglas has got to be toxic as the author of Kansas, Nebraska. No doubt. James Buchanan's big benefit is he's been in Britain for years as Minister to Great Britain. He's been out of the picture. He has no personal responsibility for Kansas, Nebraska, so he's untouched by it and can, just like Pierce got the nomination by not being involved in national politics yeah. for a decade, Buchanan doesn't have any of the stank of what has just happened on him. That's right. So, yeah, by the end of the first day of balloting, the writing's on the wall. Pierce sees he doesn't have a shot here Mm -hmm. and tells his floor managers to withdraw his name. James Buchanan is going to win the nomination. And, as you said, his most attractive quality being he wasn't around he wasn't involved in all this clamor. No. Nope. You got the Know Nothing Party nominating Millard Fillmore, as you recall from episode 13. That's right. Although most of its northern members bolted its convention because the party platform failed to repudiate the Kansas Nebraska Act. Most northern Know Nothings supported the Republican nominee, John C. Fremont. But no, nothings and Republicans split the anti Democrat vote just enough to allow James Buchanan to win the election, which Pierce took the Democratic victory as vindication of his policies. And in his final lame duck State of the Union address, he argued that the Missouri Compromise had been unconstitutional all along and blamed fanatical abolitionists for all the nation's sectional strife, including the violence in Kansas. Hmm. That's, I mean, that's a strange, uh, uh, in a way, um, he's not wrong, but he's not right. Yeah, the thing because is, it took people on both sides pressing the issue and stirring shit. Right. And as to the Missouri Compromise, in a way, it was, you can look at it in a way that it is unconstitutional. Sure. You can't, I mean, if, Monroe doubted its constitutionality right. at the beginning. The thing is, you can't... Uh, if you're you're operating under the assumption that the Old South states can have slavery be legal if they want, you can't create a new state and deny that state the ability to decide on slavery. So, it, But how it's decided is but, the problem. But here's, the th- here's how you can have the Missouri Compromise. While the area is a federal territory, Congress absolutely can ban slavery there. Slavery was banned in the territories before the Constitution. The Northwest Ordinance banned slavery in the Northwestern Territory, and Congress banned slavery in all that territory all the way up till now. And if Congress bans slavery while it's a territory... It can never get to the point where it's going to want to become a slave state. By the time it has enough people to become a state, freedom, non-slavery will be established there, and it won't ever choose to be a slave state. Yeah. So that's how the Missouri Compromise would be constitutional. But as we go forward and into the next episode, you're going to have Southerners backing off the idea that Congress can regulate slavery in yeah. territories, even though it had been doing that for years, and Thomas Jefferson was behind it uh, yeah. from the get-go. 
This is how Southerners keep backpedaling on yeah. things they used to believe in. Yeah, I'll never understand the mindset of the Southerners at this period. It just seems like the most pithy bullshit. Well, that was the presidency of Franklin Pierce, and it did not go too well. No. Pierce, you know, personally was a pretty good guy by all accounts. Yeah. Politically, his reputation uh, was very tarnished by his presidency, but he was remained personally well-liked. When he left office, William Marcy said... Quote, I venture to say that no occupants of the White House ever left Washington with such deep feelings of affection from the people of this city. That's not helping you on your think, all-time president rankings. Well, no, I, but I think that could be debated, too. Well, also, Washington, D.C., more of a southern city, so... Yeah. Yeah. But Pierce really starts getting more lambasted later on, as we'll hear mm -hmm. when we come back for Franklin Pierce's post presidential life. After this, a word from our sponsors. <laughs> The Dead Presidents Podcast is brought to you in part by Patrick Hurley, who publishes this important notice. My wife, Amanda Jane Hurley, having left my bed and board without sufficient cause, this is to give notice that I will pay no debts contracted by her in my name or on my account. Listeners, a tale too oft told. Amanda Jane Hurley has abandoned her husband for no apparent reason. I can't imagine which she could possibly have to say for herself. We have a breaking news update. Amanda Jane Hurley has something to say for herself. Finding the public cautioned against trusting me on the account of my husband, Patrick Hurley, I have to say that I never asked credit for his account from anyone, not knowing that he had credit to the amount of one loaf of bread, and that his low habits of abusing me were such as to make it impossible for me to live with him except in dread of my life. I also testify that he has left my bed and board, and left me in a suffering condition thrown on the world with an infant in my arms to seek support had I not had a kind father to lend a hand of mercy to release me from my sufferings. I also understand from good authority that my husband intends at the first opportunity to steal my child. But be assured, if he ever attempts, or any other persons assist in taking the child from me, it shall end in death. For I do not consider him capable of taking care of my child, for he has never done a father's part by it since its birth. There you have it, listeners. If you help Patrick Hurley try to steal his child away from Amanda, she will fucking kill you. Don't even think about laying a finger on that child unless you're trying to take a permanent dirt nap. What is this deadbeat dad after anyway? I think it's obvious. Patrick Hurley wants to get a hold of the infant so he can enter it into the National Baby Show. I say no way, Patrick! If anyone deserves that baby's prize money, it's Amanda. She's the only one who's ever taken care of it, and she needs help escaping the suffering condition she's been left in by her piece-of-shit husband. That's a message from our sponsor, Amanda Jane Hurley. Now a word from our sponsor, Dr. Lowcox Female Wafers. 
Dr. Lowcock's female wafers are a certain cure for suppressed menses, painful menstruation, partial obstruction of menses, green sickness, leukorrhea, and all female weaknesses. Ladies, are you suffering from difficult menstruation? Do you have whitish, yellowish, or greenish vaginal discharge? Are you PMSing so hard that you've publicly threatened to kill your estranged husband? Dr. Lowcock's female wafers offer instant relief. Don't let afflictions of the lady parts go untreated. Try Dr. Lowcock's female wafers today. There are only wafer thin. And now, a message from our sponsor, Jackson Crockett. Fifty dollars reward. I will pay the reward of fifty dollars for information which shall lead to the detection of the villain who shot my horse. Listeners, you can't get any lower than the vile and loathsome wretch who heinously murdered Jackson Crockett's horse. We all remember that exceptional equine proudly carrying Jackson around town, and we all attended her heart-rending funeral. There was nary a dry eye in the pasture when she was laid in an early grave, and we'll never forget those little colts and fillies crying out for their mama. But the time for tears has passed. And the time for revenge is nigh at hand. There's fifty bucks coming your way if you could help us find the abhorrent bastard responsible for this foul deed. So we can beat him to a bloody pulp. Then tie him to a team of horses who were friends of the deceased. And let them drag his detestable carcass until he's deader than dyke. That's a message from our sponsor, Jackson Crockett. And now, back to the show. Time to dive into the post-presidential life of Franklin Pierce. He's... Well, his early life had a lot of tragedies leading up to his presidency. His presidency, pretty tragic in itself. Yeah. Pretty dark. Maybe things will pick up for him post-presidency. Or maybe they won't. <laughs> Well, one of the first issues of his post-presidency is Jane Pierce's health. She suffers from chronic tuberculosis. Her health is so poor that the Pierces can't leave Washington after the inauguration, but have to stick around for weeks while she convalesces. Back in New Hampshire, Pierce becomes friends with Charles March, who would be a close companion for the rest of his life, and... A drinking buddy. Pierce is looking to spend the winter in a warm climate for the benefit of Jane's health. Charles March arranges for them to stay with his uncle, who is the American consul on Madeira Island off the coast of Morocco. Yeah, and this trip actually did take a turn for the better for Jane. She, uh... Her health improves, and... Her letters from this period kind of harken back to the letters of just wonderment of nature. She was always fascinated just with nature. There's letters from her youth, from when she was in school, that she wrote saying that she kept going to the door and taking and eating snow, and it just thrilled her. Hmm. And this kind of gives her that same feeling. She's fascinated with the nature. She talks about some intense storms and uh, just 
general nature observations, it seems to do her great good. Yeah, well, she's well enough for the Pierces to go on a tour of Europe, and they visited Portugal, Spain, France, Switzerland, and Italy, where in Rome, Pierce reunites with his old friend, Nathaniel Hawthorne. That's right. Yeah, Pierce had appointed Hawthorne as American consul in Liverpool, and Hawthorne moved to Rome after being replaced by a Buchanan appointee. Now, at the time, Hawthorne's daughter was deathly ill, and having the Pierces around was a major source of comfort. Hawthorne would later write, quote, Never having had any trouble before that pierced into my very vitals, I did not know what great comfort there might be in the manly sympathy of a friend but Pierce has undergone so great a sorrow of his own, and has so large and kindly a heart, and is so tender and strong, that he really did us good, and I shall always love him better for the recollection of those dark days. That's pretty nice. It is. And Hawthorne's daughter would recover. The Pierces would continue their tour, visiting Venice, Vienna... Germany and Belgium until Jane's health started to deteriorate once again which prompted their return to the US the following winter they would travel to the Bahamas for Jane's health yeah going to warm climates the go to treatment for tuberculosis that's it warm dry climate yeah, we didn't really mention Pierce's uh, vice president, William Rufus King, had tuberculosis. Well, yeah, we'll be talking about him a lot more in the he, next episode. Yeah, but. he went to Cuba for his health. Yeah, that's right. William Rufus King uh, in Cuba at the time of Pierce's inauguration due to his health also dealing with tuberculosis. He is the only vice president to be sworn in and take the oath of office on foreign soil. Yeah. But we'll learn a lot more about him in the next episode. Yeah, well, speaking of James Buchanan and his administration, it was such a disaster <laughs> that some Democrats, including Jefferson Davis urged Pierce to seek the 1860 Democratic nomination. Pierce adamantly refused to be considered. He instead encouraged Jefferson Davis to seek the nomination. After Democrats failed to settle on a nominee at two attempts at a convention, Northern Democrats nominated Stephen Douglas, Southern Democrats nominated John C. Breckinridge. All Pierce's work on party unity... Now you have an open party split. That's right. And not only that, you got the Constitutional Union Party who nominates John Bell. Mm hmm. Well, and of course, Lincoln. Yep. Running as the Republican candidate. You got a four way series here. Yeah. Well, when the Democrat Party splits apart, Pierce's former Postmaster General, James Campbell, begged Pierce to allow himself to become a compromise candidate, hoping he can knit the Democratic Party back together, but he refused to be considered once again. When the Civil War broke out, Pierce blamed Republicans for starting the war, but remained loyal to the Union. I don't know that it, that Pierce would have worked as a compromise candidate. I think there were people that thought he would have worked, but I think overall yeah, it wouldn't have worked. Well guess people were getting pretty desperate at the time. Pretty much. I mean, yeah, you got a lot going on. Well, Pierce stays in the Union. He was publicly silent about it, but he supported a war to protect the North from Southern invasion. Not much of a fan of an aggressive Northern war to subjugate the South. In 1863, when the Union Army 
occupied Jefferson Davis's plantation. Pierce's 1860 letter encouraging Davis to run for president was found and published, with some Republican newspapers calling Pierce a copperhead and a traitor. Yeah, there's a lot going on at this time. Um, there are rumors starting to circulate, and they have been for some time, since the beginning of the war. There are stories of a shadow organization in the North called the Knights of the Golden Circle. And this clandestine group is said to be a militant group raising anti-Lincoln support in the North for an eventual coup. And they're supposed to be working with the Confederacy. Now... This is all bullshit. There, there's not really a Knights of the Golden Circle. This is just something that the Republican press uses, and uses to great effect in terms of jailing literally hundreds and hundreds of people when Lincoln suspends the writ of habeas corpus, and a lot of people start getting thrown in jail, not just for being anti-Lincoln, but even for questioning the war in general. Yeah. People could be thrown in prison for it. And stories get out after Pierce takes a trip to Michigan and then to Kentucky to visit former cabinet members that Pierce is involved in this organization and not only is he involved He's one of the ringleaders, if not at the top of it. And so stories start to come out that Franklin Pierce is the head of a secret militant organization in the North (laughs) that is planning on attempting a coup against Lincoln with the aid of the Southern Confederacy to put Pierce in the White House in the North so that the Confederacy... And the United States can exist peacefully side by side. These are the stories that are coming out. Pretty nuts. Yeah. Now, again, this is all bullshit. (laughs) But enough is put into it that William Seward, Secretary of State under Abraham Lincoln writes Pierce a brazen letter where he pretty much just says sir you're being accused of this any explanation would be acceptable (laughs) just like where does he get off I mean it's a really impetuous letter and Pierce responds pretty indignantly and defends himself which prompts an an apology from Seward yeah who says that it was an underling that wrote the letter but then he goes on to add a bizarre postscript defending his use of the term sir and uh Pierce would respond to that letter basically tearing Seward a new asshole and making him look kind of like a pithy dickhead Mm -hmm. for spreading around such crap at such a high level and using it for what Pierce considered a pretty shitty political advantage which was strong arming people and putting anybody opposed in prison. Yeah. Well, now there were there was such an outcry over this that there were actually calls from Congress to make that correspondence public. <laughs> and Seward was in a position where yeah, he had to agree. So he released 3 of the 4 letters omitting the fourth one. But a Democratic senator from California happened to have a copy of Pierce's other response because he was one of the ones that had led the call for the release of it in order to vindicate Pierce. Yeah. 
Because Pierce, in his second letter, had said, I want this made public. I want this kept on file in the State Department because you're full of shit, Mm -hmm. essentially. Seward tried withholding that fourth letter, and this senator just conveniently happened to have it. He makes out like Seward had just made a mistake and offers to help yeah. by publicly reading the letter aloud to his colleagues in the Senate. And it's really a bad look for Seward and the administration. And even the most virulent of anti Pierce papers come out and say that he had been maligned and he had been wronged and that Seward was at fault here. Yeah. Because the question here is, and what Pierce's biggest problem with the Lincoln administration is, is there an abuse of executive power going on here? Does Lincoln have the right to throw people in jail? Is this an alien and sedition act thing? Is this worse? Yeah, well, I mean, the Alien and Sedition Acts came around out of fear that war would break out in the United States, potentially civil war. Now we've actually got one. Yeah. This is actually when the Constitution squarely allows the writ of habeas corpus to be suspended, but that yeah. definitely opens it up to potential for abuse. Yeah. And, you know, certainly not... In Pierce's mind, they were abusing it. Yeah, not easy decisions for the Lincoln administration to make one, they did arrest one of the arrests was of an Ohio Democrat who had called the war a failure. Pierce gave an impassioned speech in defense of free speech over this guy's arrest. And that speech was so popular among Democrats that some encouraged him to seek the 1864 democratic nomination for president. So despite Pierce's presidency being very unsuccessful. Yeah, he, there are repeated keep repeated calling calls back. to have him come back. He refuses again, of course. After well, and at this point, Jane has died. Yeah, so there's that. Yeah, Jane she died always in 1863. In Ill health. She ends up passing away in 1863. Mm-hmm. But Pierce not trying to get back into the politics, certainly not in the middle of the Civil War. After Lincoln's assassination, Pierce ran into a problem. He had an angry crowd gather at his home, demanding to know why he wasn't flying a flag to honor Lincoln. Kind of a similar problem that Fillmore had about not draping his house in black. Right. Well, where Fillmore was out of town, Pierce was there. And he had to come out and answer to this angry mob. Mm -hmm. And apparently his response was such that the crowd not only departed amicably, but they were left moved by his words. Yeah, they gave him three cheers before they dispersed. He said that his heart mingles its deepest regrets and sorrows with yours. If the period during which I have served our state and country in various situations, commencing more than 35 years ago, have left the question of my devotion to the flag, the Constitution, and the Union in doubt, it is too late now to remove it. Yeah. And it goes over well. Yeah. Pierce, you know, he... His old friend Jefferson Davis, obviously on the other side, in 1867, when Davis is imprisoned on treason charges, Pierce traveled to Virginia to visit him and offered to join his legal defense team. Davis politely declined that offer. He already had a defense team. Davis was never tried, but after his release, Pierce offered to let him stay at Pierce's cottage. Again, Davis declined. I think he and his wife went to Canada. (laughs) Yeah. Well, and speaking of old friends, in 1863, Pierce and an ill Nathaniel Hawthorne decided to take a little trip together. Yeah, Pierce... um, Yeah, he... We're down to the last years of his life, and things continue to get dark for him. Yeah. 
Jane died, obviously, in 1863. Hawthorne attended that funeral, described Pierce as, quote, overwhelmed with grief. Now Hawthorne's dying. He wants to go on a little trip with Pierce. His wife hoped it might help him yeah, improve Sophia his health. Yeah, Sophia Hawthorne thinks it's a good idea. Yeah, and she wrote to Pierce, I would not trust him in any hands now except such gentle and tender hands as yours. Which is a pretty big compliment to Pierce. Yeah, and they go on a trip through northern New Hampshire. They stay in adjoining rooms together. And Hawthorne, according to Pierce's account, seems to be doing pretty good. He seems to be doing well now that he's back in the presence of his best friend. And he kind of rebounds a little bit. And, well, one night, it just doesn't work out. Uh, Pierce had a regimen where he would check on Hawthorne in the night and make sure he was doing all right. Cause he wasn't doing great. The trip seemed to help him a bit, but Pierce was still concerned. So he'd check on him in the night. And one particular night we checked on him. He seemed to be doing good, restfully sleeping. It was about 10 o'clock at about three o'clock. Pierce checked on him again and he was, in the same position. He had peacefully passed away in his sleep. And Pierce took detailed notes about their activities and detailed the last day. Yeah. In particular. And I can't help but think that he did that thinking that people were going to say they were drinking. And yeah. that Franklin Pierce is not only a doe-faced traitor to the Union, but he murdered Hawthorne. <laughs> yeah, in, in episode one on the Tough Five Drunkest Presidents, we proposed the conspiracy theory that... Uh, a drinking game had occurred. That Hawthorne... Hawthorne was on yeah, the losing end. He died in a drinking contest with, with Pierce... And, yeah, it's funny to think, like, you know, it's like the movie The Hangover. Like, Pierce wakes up and Hawthorne's dead and he has to figure out what happened and explain himself. And, yeah, that's was kind of fun to joke about. But this is, like, really sad. Yeah. Like, his life, Pierce's life, is uh, really dark. Yeah. But, yeah, that was an issue that, yeah, they're going to say that we were drinking. Because Pierce was drinking a lot. At this time. Well, and it just after this, his wife's gone, mm -hmm. his best friend's gone, no family. He pretty much just devolves yeah. into drinking. Well, even, you know, after he left, you know, leaving the presidency, he has the now infamous quote. After the White House, what is there to do but drink? Yeah. And while Jane was still alive in her last year, she spent a lot of time staying with her sister. And Pierce was alone a lot of that time, mm, drinking a lot. Do. Some might uh, question whether Jane was staying apart from him because of his drinking, yeah. or if he was just taking advantage of her absence to drink. But yeah, it was getting pretty bad. Yeah. His health declined sharply in 1869, where his buddy, Charles March, attributed that to his drinking. He yeah, gets, I he, mean, gets, he, he ends up with cirrhosis of the liver. Yep. People who would go to visit him would find him, quote, sadly emaciated and too weak to leave his bed. And he was cognizant that he was dying, telling his doctors that he knew he would not recover. A nurse was hired to take care of him, and there's no family around 
nobody present during his final days. Franklin Pierce dies on October 8th, 1869 at the age of 64. His last words were not recorded. Now here's a guy who's been through some shit. I think Franklin Pierce is probably one of the if not the most tragic of presidential stories. Yeah. For such a decent person, like, he's, like, universally, like, seen as, like, a really good guy, and he just has all this terrible shit happen to him. I think he it's the most tragic presidential story. Yeah, he definitely has a very dark and sad story. Yeah. I mean, you know, we've come to the end. We can sum him up as a person. And you're talking a really affable guy. Or somebody that you'd really like to hang out with. Mm-hmm. A great speaker. Good looks. A total package. Yeah, he was just seemed so like um, everyone saw him as so like warm and caring. Unfortunately, you know how much tragedy he had been through enabled him to console others. Yeah, like he was there for Hawthorne, and Hawthorne's wife trusted him to take care of her husband when she wouldn't have trusted anyone else. Um, well, and ha- he had tried to deal with Jane in all those years of her gloom and Pierce had to endure a lot of shit I mean he got bashed in the press a lot there's a story of as president at a reception he had given a speech and was walking through the crowd and he got egged by a guy (laughs) who pelted him with eggs and the guy was arrested and the guy tried to slit his wrists with a pen knife in prison the guy was clearly a nut but he was a staunch abolitionist and hated Pierce yeah so he thought that it would be a good idea to egg him, and then when he got caught for it, tried to kill himself with a penknife. Well, that guy may be the spiritual predecessor of the guy who threw shoes at George W. Bush. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, Pierce, you know, obviously his presidency was not successful, and he would come into a lot of just criticism about some of his policies, particularly his (coughs) views about slavery and how he allowed slavery to reemerge as an issue. But right. then he did get a lot of unfair criticism, people calling him a coward about the Mexican American War, and then people calling him a knight of the golden circle or yeah. whatever that Yeah, there was a lot of was. Bu- there was a lot of bullshit that he had to deal with. Yeah, and just his family situation so devastating. Yeah, I mean, he's really seems like he would be a really cool guy, like a really likable person. Mm-hmm. But he just dealt with so much shit. And yeah, and it, his his politics, sadly, he's not on the right side of history. So he is justly ranked low. He belongs down there yeah. as president. But I think as a person... Maybe give Franklin Pierce the benefit of the doubt in some ways. Try and factor in the context of the times and look at what all this guy had to deal with in his life. He did not have a particularly happy life by any stretch. No. Yeah. He was, a, he was a really good man. Just in general that didn't understand his own shortcomings and that had to deal with a lot of crap 
Mm-hmm. I think we could pity Franklin Pierce. Yeah, because it, you know, after all he went through, at the end, he's alone. He has no family. He dies alone. We don't know his last words. He basically like drank himself to death. Yeah, that he was spending his last years just like sitting there drinking. Mm-hmm. Yeah, he could have done something much better suited for himself and his family if he had I don't know the attorney general job would have been perfect for him uh could have been on the supreme court I don't know there's other things that I think he would have been better suited at but sadly well there aren't aren't many people suited to be president at this time this is the worst decade to try to be president in. That's for sure. And you know, as you know, whatever Pierce was or could have been, like he wasn't, you know, the great one in a generation statesman that was gonna rise above all this stuff to do yeah, something about that's it. That's what was needed at the time. Pierce was a good politician, but he was not a statesman. Yeah. That could not be said for him. Yeah, that's He can't. had the ability I think in him to have been a successful statesman because he was attractive and popular to a lot of people but Mm -hmm. not at this time on this issue the way things were playing out that's it a lot the same could be said for Fillmore and Prey Buchanan as well indeed and that's gonna bring us to the end of Franklin Pierce well as always on the show when we have gone on a presidential trip, and they have been numerous. We like to tell our listeners about it, and Franklin Pierce is one of the ones that we've been to. Well, partly. The Hillsboro Homestead was not open when we visited Hillsboro, New Hampshire, but we went there. Yeah, that was his childhood home. And the home of his father, where he had a tavern where Pierce grew up hearing stories of Jeffersonian democracy, getting it instilled early on. Mm-hmm. Yeah, we bro, a nice, quaint little town. We saw the house from the outside, peered in the windows. Yep. And then in nearby Concord, we went to the Pierce Mance. It's pretty nice. had a really nice tour there. And I think that was another one where we were the only ones there, which is always a delight. Yeah. Well, there will be a lot of people going there now. Yeah. All of our listeners will be clamoring to see the Pierce home. That's for sure. Make sure you go at a time when the uh, Hillsboro home is open, too, so that you could get both in. And yeah. uh, Concord was a real, really nice town Concord as well. Concord is an awesome town. Yeah, it's the state capital despite having a very small town atmosphere like one minute you're on a back road that seems like in the middle of nowhere and a minute later you're in front of the state capitol building. that's right and there's just like that angle parking mm-hmm. no meters or nothing like that some great restaurants there mm-hmm. also real close to the home is the cemetery where franklin pierce is buried and we visited there and i actually personally landscaped it yeah and really spruced it up and made it look really nice and that made me feel good and I think that was a little bit of justice for Franklin Pierce yeah yeah we were there that was many years ago we were there at the grave we played in honor of Pierce a song written and recorded about him by the constitutionalist that you're going to hear at the end of the episode has been played at his grave so yeah we recommend checking that out absolutely book wise on Franklin Pierce you got the I think the original is Roy Franklin Nichols book on Franklin Pierce that is actually uh, really really anti-Pierce But then he later added an additional chapter where he reappraised Pierce and his own work and tried to be a little bit more balanced with it. 
You also have, uh, as we quoted from earlier, Peter Walner did a two-volume work on Pierce. Volume 1, New Hampshire's Favorite Son, and Volume 2, Martyr for the Union. Highly recommended. It is a fantastic modern look at Pierce. Uh, There's a couple other uh, little things. There's one that Gary Bullard or Bullard uh, wrote called The Expatriation of Franklin Pierce, The Story of a President and the Civil War, which focuses on Pierce's post-presidency and talks all about his uh, run-in with Seward and the whole Knights of the Golden Circle debacle that gets into uh, his trip with Jane and her death and his final trip with Hawthorne and how he spent his final days. There's a letter book that the New Hampshire Historical Society put out uh, called Persistent Patriot, the letters of Franklin Pierce that has some real gems in there. And you also get... uh, the only existing letters of Benny Pierce yeah. are reprinted in there, and that kind of gives you in, insight into what a intelligent kid he was, mm-hmm. and what a sad loss. Maybe a would-be president himself. You never know. I read the um, Pierce biography in the American President series by Michael F. Holt. Concise biography it was pretty cool kind of uh, posited that Pierce's obsession with trying to maintain party unity that is was really a, what that led that him was astray. was a for him. Mm-hmm. And I think it cost him. Yeah. The end, as we've learned. Mm-hmm. And then, of course, you got Nathaniel Hawthorne's campaign biography That's of right. Pierce. You could check out Nathaniel Hawthorne's campaign biography, yeah. The Life of Franklin Pierce. You gotta put it Put it on your shelf right next to the Scarlet Letter. Mm-hmm. No Hawthorne collection is complete without the campaign biography of Franklin Pierce. Nor any Pierce Presidential Library. That's right. So let's conclude. Let us sum up, or rather, let us not try. But let's leave it to the contemporaries to provide the final words on Franklin mm-hmm. Pierce. Yep, you got Gideon Wells, who was Lincoln's Navy secretary. He said, Pierce was a vain, showy, pliant man who by his errors and weakness broke down his administration and his party throughout the country. That's one side of the coin there. On a similar sign, future President Theodore Roosevelt said of Pierce, Pierce was a small politician of low capacity and mean surroundings, proud to act as the servile tool of men worse than himself, but also stronger and abler. He was ever ready to do any work the slavery leaders set him. Hmm. T.R. not a fan. Nope. Well, here we've got James Buchanan, who wrote in 1852, when Pierce was running, It is his peculiar distinction above all other public men within my knowledge that he has never had occasion to take a single step backwards. What speech, vote, or sentiment of his whole public career has been inconsistent with the purest and strictest principles of Jeffersonian democracy? Our candidate throughout his life has proved himself to be peculiarly unselfish. The honors and offices which other men seek with so much eagerness have sought him only to be refused. Indeed, the public character of General Pierce is so invulnerable that it has scarcely been seriously assaulted. Well, that can be said if you look at Pierce's congressional record. He really was somebody that stuck by his word. He was... Not wavering, never flip-flopping. He looked at things 
with a strict interpretation of the Constitution, and he stood by it, by God, and he wasn't going to swerve from it. So I don't know if he's as weak as some would say, although maybe it could be argued that the policies were mm -hmm. weak. Finally, Nathaniel Hawthorne said of Pierce, quote, he has in him many of the chief elements of a great ruler. His talents are administrative, but he has a subtle faculty of making affairs roll onward according to his will, and of influencing their course without showing any trace of his action. There are scores of men in the country that seem brighter than he is, but he has the directing mind, and will move them about like pawns on a chessboard and turn all their abilities to better purpose than they themselves do. That being from the campaign biography. That's right. Maybe a prediction about Pierce's presidency. Maybe it didn't come totally to fruition. I prefer uh, Hawthorne's quote that said that Pierce had so large and kindly a heart, and it's so tender and strong. Yeah. That's the private man Pierce that is probably worth more praise and admiration than President Pierce. Agreed. And that's going to bring us to the end of episode 14, Franklin Pierce. And now we conclude with another installment from that wonderful band, those titans of teaching, those minstrels of madness, the constitutionalists. Here is Franklin Pierce. Thanks for listening. Thanks.